Welcome to the Audio Renaissance presentation of The Meaning of Life, Buddhist Perspectives on Cause and Effect, written by Tenzin Gyatso, the 14th Dalai Lama, translated and edited by Jeffrey Hopkins, abridged and produced by Jill Whitesides, and read by Ken McLeod. We begin with an introduction by translator and editor Jeffrey Hopkins. Why are we in this situation? Where are we going? Do our lives have any meaning? How should we make use of our lives? How does Buddhism view the position of beings in the world and the ways humans can make their lives meaningful? These questions about the meaning of life are addressed in a famous Buddhist painting of a wheel with 21 parts that outlines the process of rebirth. The diagram, said to be designed by the Buddha himself, depicts an inner psychological cosmology that has had great influence throughout Asia. It is much like a map of the world or the periodic table of chemical elements, but it is a map of an internal process and its external effects. In Tibet, This painting is at the doorway of practically every temple. It vividly describes how we become trapped in a maelstrom of suffering and how this process can be reversed, showing how Buddhists place themselves in an ever-changing universe of cause and effect. By illuminating the causes behind our situation, the wheel of cyclic existence reveals how, through practicing antidotes to these causes, we can overcome the painful and limiting situations that are their effects. It shows the altruistic purpose that can make life meaningful. The description of the steps of entrapment is a call to action, for it shows how the prison of selfishness can be turned into a source of help and happiness for oneself and others. At the top right of the painting as we face it, the Buddha is standing with his left hand in a teaching pose and with the index finger of the right hand pointing to a moon on the other side at the top left. The moon symbolizes liberation. Buddha is pointing out that freedom from pain is possible, setting an optimistic tone for the whole painting. The intent of the painting is not to communicate mere knowledge of a process, but to put this knowledge to use in redirecting and uplifting our lives. The word Buddha itself makes an important point about the nature of affliction and liberation. The term Buddha is a past participle of the Sanskrit verbal root bud which means to awaken or to spread. And thus, when put in the context of Buddhism, the verbal root means to awaken from the sleep of ignorance and spread one's intelligence to everything that can be known, to overcome ignorance and become omniscient. The general way of making a past participle in Sanskrit is to add T-A, like the English E-D in showed or T in built. Since to say Buddha would be non-euphonic, the T is voiced to become a D. This is how the word Buddha comes to mean one who has become enlightened, that is to say, one who has overcome the sleep of ignorance and has spread his or her intelligence to everything that can be known. The significance of the fact that the word Buddha is a past participle is that Buddhas are necessarily beings who previously were not Buddhas. They are persons who were asleep and have awakened. They were, like us, trapped in a state of cyclic existence, going from lifetime to lifetime through the sufferings of birth, aging, sickness, and death. The Buddha, whose teaching we still have, is considered to be one among many Buddhas of our era. It is said that he was actually enlightened eons ago and emanated a form called a supreme emanation body, appearing to take birth in a royal family in an Indian kingdom around 563 B.C. He left the princely life and went into retreat in 524, became enlightened six years later, and died in his 80th year, having taught for 45 years. Prior to his enlightenment, the Buddha was an ordinary being, just like any of us. There is no one who is enlightened from the start. Each of us is or has been in a state of cyclic existence, passing through birth, aging, sickness and death over and over due to our actions, which are largely motivated by afflictive emotions. 
emotions with which we afflict ourselves. For instance, when we get angry and our face turns red and contorted, we afflict even our external appearance. These afflictive emotions, negative influences peripheral to the basic pure nature of the mind, are based on an ignorant misapprehension of the status of phenomena. Not knowing how things actually exist, we superimpose onto phenomena an over-concretized status that they actually do not have. The object doesn't have to be important in the larger scale of life. It can be very small. It can be candy, a slice of pizza, whatever. Before becoming lustful or hateful, ourselves and the object are misapprehended in such a way that a veritable mess of emotions is generated. The wheel in the center of the painting is in the grasp of a frightful monster. This signifies that the entire process of cyclic existence is caught within transience. Everything in our type of life is characterized by impermanence. Whatever is built will fall down, whatever and whoever come together will separate. The wheel itself shows us how to recognize our own condition. The 21 parts of the diagram address the question of how and why we are born into self-defeating situations. What motivates virtuous and non-virtuous actions? What are the various types of lives? What is the chain of causation? The middle of the wheel depicts the basic problem. In the very center is a pig, symbolizing ignorance, that drives the entire process. The pig stands for the root ignorance, which isn't just an inability to apprehend the truth, but an active misapprehension of the status of oneself and all other objects. It is the assumption that phenomena exist in a more concrete way than they actually do. Based on this misapprehension of the status of persons and things, we are drawn into afflictive desire and hatred, symbolized by a rooster and a snake, respectively. In many drawings of the wheel, these two are depicted as coming out of the pig's mouth to indicate that without ignorance, lust and hatred are impossible. Both the rooster and the snake grasp the pig's tail in their mouths to indicate that they promote even more ignorance, confusion, bewilderment, and cloudiness. Not knowing the real nature of phenomena, we generate desire for what we like and hatred for what blocks our desires and for what we do not like. These three, ignorance, desire, and hatred, are called the three poisons. They pervert our mental outlook. The light and dark half-circles just outside the hub indicate virtuous and non-virtuous actions motivated by the triad of ignorance, desire, and hatred. In the dark half-circle are persons engaged in counterproductive actions. They face downward to indicate that negative actions lead to lower states. In the light half-circle, persons engaged in positive actions face upward to indicate that virtuous actions lead to more favorable states. The types of states to which productive and counterproductive actions lead are depicted by six sectors drawn around the half-circles of actions. Though the wheel is divided into two parts, with three sectors on the top representing the three happy transmigrations and three sectors on the bottom representing the three bad transmigrations, all are equally caught within cyclic existence. The sector at the top comprises gods, these gods lead long and enjoyable lives, but when virtuous actions that cause them to be born in that state are exhausted, they suffer through being reborn in lower levels. They are especially afflicted by knowledge near the time of death that their high state is ending due to the fact that they have spent their time in enjoyment without engaging in virtuous activities. To the right of the gods is the realm of demigods, also translated as non-gods because they are minor compared to gods. A tree with plenty of fruit has grown in their land, and a demigod with a knife is trying to reach up to cut off a piece of fruit. But the fruited part of the tree is in the god's land, and he cannot reach it. The gods enjoy the fruit that grows from the land of demigods, just as industrialized countries take ore out of third world countries, or as certain multinational corporations live off the backs of poor people working for them. Because their wealth mainly benefits others, Demigods are particularly afflicted by jealousy and the consequent suffering of attacking and being wounded by the gods. 
The sector of humans is on the top left side. Humans undergo hunger, thirst, heat, cold, separation from friends, being plagued by enemies, searching for but not finding what is desired, and having to undergo what is undesired. Also, there are the general sufferings of birth, aging, sickness, and death. The painting contains figures in a range of human activities, from butchering animals to living a monastic life. It seems to me that the range indicates that education can take place in a human lifetime. Thus, even if God's lives are loftier, they don't have the fortune of the improvement that many humans can undergo. Humans often have a mixture of pleasure and pain, such that we are not always overwhelmed by pain, but suffer enough so that we are motivated to find a way to improve our situation. On the bottom half of the wheel, we see on the left side the realm of animals, who are particularly afflicted by being used for others' purposes and by their incapacity for speech. Opposite them is the realm of hungry ghosts, who are particularly troubled by hunger and thirst. Hungry ghosts are constantly looking but are unable to find food or drink. They have huge stomachs but tiny throats such that only the smallest amounts can enter. The sector at the bottom depicts the hells, the eight hot hells, the eight cold hells, and neighboring hells. Neighboring hells are related as follows. A person dwelling in a hot hell, boiling in molten iron, eventually exhausts the karma that caused his birth there. That person emerges from there, and upon seeing a lovely lake, for instance, rushes into it, only to sink into a mass of rotten corpses. The point is that we find it hard to learn that the very process of attraction and repulsion, which gets us into hellish trouble in the first place, ought to be avoided entirely. The 8th century Indian scholar adept, Kamalashila, says the sufferings of the six realms of beings are to be viewed not just as occurring in those types of rebirth, but also in human lives. He said, Those afflicted by having their limbs cut off, being impaled, hanged, and so forth, suffer like hell beings. Those who are poor and deprived and are pained by hunger and thirst suffer like hungry ghosts. Those in servitude, whose bodies are controlled by others and who are oppressed, suffer from being struck, bound, and so forth, like animals." Unquote. My first teacher of Tibetan Buddhism, who had escaped the communist takeover of Tibet, used to say that the Americans were the gods and the Russians were the demigods. In this way, we can view these realms as representing types of beings in cyclic existence but also periods in one's own or other's lives, as short as five minutes or months or even a lifetime. In this way, motivated by ignorance, symbolized by the three animals in the center, we engage in virtuous and non-virtuous actions, symbolized by the two half-circles, which leads to rebirth in the six realms of cyclic existence. What is the process? What are the stages of cause and effect? The twelve parts of the outside rim of the wheel present the process in detail. These are called twelve links because they comprise the causal sequence of lives in cyclic existence. Let us mention them before describing them in detail. The dependent arising of cyclic existence begins with link one, ignorance, which motivates link two, an action. At the conclusion of the action, a predisposition is established within consciousness, link 3a, called the cause consciousness. This leads, after what can be a long time, to rebirth, link 3b, which is called the effect consciousness. The beginning of a new lifetime, link 4, is called name and form. The next stage, the development of the embryo, link 5, is called sense spheres. From formation of the body, contact is developed, which is link 6. From contact, there is feeling, link 7. From feeling, attachment, link 8. From attachment, grasping, link 9. From grasping, there develops at the end of the lifetime a stage called existence, which is the moment just before the new lifetime. It is link 10. The new lifetime begins with link 11, birth, then continues with link 12, aging and death. 
The first link is indicated by an old blind person hobbling with a cane, which symbolizes ignorance. Why? The person is old because the ignorance driving cyclic existence is beginningless. The person is blind because ignorance is obscured with respect to the true nature of persons and other phenomena. The person hobbles with a cane because ignorance, no matter how much suffering it creates, has no valid foundation. It isn't based on the truth and therefore can be undermined by wisdom. There are two types of ignorance, a basic form and a secondary form involved only in negative actions. The first misconceives the status of persons and other phenomena, imagining these have a concreteness beyond that which they actually have, thereby inducing all afflictive emotions. It is called a consciousness that conceives inherent existence. Thus, the basic ignorance is not just absence of knowledge of the real status of phenomena, but the active conception of the opposite, that is, the conception of inherent existence, whereas in actuality, phenomena do not inherently exist. We perceive things as though they were able to cover the parts of which they are constituted, whereas there is nothing that covers all those parts. For example, because a collection of four legs and a top is able to hold up objects, we are deceived into thinking that there is something called a table that encompasses those elements. Although phenomena do not exist inherently by way of their own character, we conceive them to do so. This is ignorance. Here, in the twelve links of dependent arising, ignorance refers to the misconception of oneself as inherently existent, and to the misconception that phenomena that are part of one's continuum, such as mind and body, inherently exist. The person is actually only designated in dependence upon a collection of mind and body. He or she is understood to be merely nominally existent. Still, this view does not make the person as if dead, or turn the person into the body on which a surgeon operates. When a surgeon cuts open the body and doesn't find any person, he or she might think there is only matter. Obviously, this is not the Buddhist position. Why would we develop compassion for others if they were just dead wood? The basic form of ignorance conceives a person who exists only in dependence upon mind and body to inherently exist, to occupy a spot in a concrete way, and then conceives of mind and body as inherently existent mine, things owned by the self or I. The other form of ignorance, the type involved only in non-virtuous actions, is a misconception about relationships of actions and their effects, not understanding that if a certain action is performed, a certain result will follow, and developing such misconceptions as pleasure will arise from theft. If we really knew what it would be like to undergo the future effects of a non-virtuous action, we wouldn't do it. We wouldn't commit murder, steal, engage in sexual misconduct, lie, talk divisively, speak harshly, chatter senselessly, and so forth. The second link, action, is symbolized by a potter making a pot. If we take our present lifetime as an example, the first link, ignorance, refers to the ignorance in a former lifetime that motivated the one action serving as the main karma projecting this rebirth. It does not refer to the ignorance that occurs throughout a lifetime, but to the one period, even just a few moments, that motivates a single significant action leading to another lifetime. For example, if we were in a bad transmigration, that is, if we were not in a human lifetime, which is considered a happy transmigration, the action that generated it could have been an act of murder. In that case, the period of ignorance would be the time in which the murder was planned, carried out, and completed. That action may take only a few minutes. It may take longer. Also, there would be additional ignorance in the form of misapprehension of the effects of murder. The main action projecting rebirth as a human has to be a virtuous action, restraining oneself from misconduct. Although there are also causes other than ethics, in order to achieve a lifetime in one of the three happy transmigrations, that is, as a god, demigod, or human, it is necessary that the projecting cause of that lifetime be an action of ethics. The third link, 
consciousness is symbolized by a monkey. In the twelve links of dependent arising, consciousness is of two types, cause and effect. Let's consider cause consciousness first. When the action has been completed, its potency infuses the consciousness that exists at that time. This brief period of mind, the cause consciousness, occurs immediately upon completion of the action. This consciousness is a neutral entity capable of being infused with virtuous or non-virtuous predispositions. Because it is neutral, it can be stained with any type of predisposition. For example, if one places something with a strong odor next to something neutral, the neutral substance picks up the odor of the strong one. In this way, the action leaves its imprint on the consciousness. The predisposition is a potency that has been imprinted in a certain fashion, virtuous or non-virtuous, meritorious or non-meritorious, and will lead to a future lifetime. In accordance with the strength of this potency, people die at various ages. Some people live a long time, and some do not. The potency that mainly led to this lifetime may have been established in any previous lifetime, even a million lifetimes or a million eons ago. Then, at the end of the lifetime just previous, the potency for this lifetime was nourished by certain factors. Consider the fact that when someone asks, if there is another lifetime, what would you like to be? We immediately say, I'd like to be a... This shows that we are already nourishing certain kinds of potencies. Now, regarding effect consciousness, the potency nourished this way is fully activated at the end of the previous lifetime. Between any two lifetimes, there is an intermediate state which can be as short as one moment or as long as 49 days. It is said that during the intermediate state, you are seeking a place to take rebirth, wandering in places where beings are copulating. But if you do not have a potency to take a certain kind of rebirth, there is no way that you can enter a specific female's womb. Leaving the intermediate state, you enter the womb of your new mother if you are taking womb birth. Called the effect consciousness, that one moment is the beginning of the new life. In this presentation of the twelve links of dependent arising, the first two and a half links, ignorance, action, and cause consciousness, can occur in any past lifetime and are called projecting causes because they provide the main impetus for an entire lifetime. Effect consciousness and the fourth through tenth links from name and form through existence occur in this lifetime. They are called projected effects because they constitute the lifetime established by the projecting causes. The creation of a particular life is due to karma, and ignorance underlies the entire process. This being the case, the way to improve lives is to learn about the relationships between actions and their effects, so we can create more productive situations. The way to gain liberation is to develop wisdom that realizes the actual status of phenomena, so that the afflictive emotions that drive cyclic existence cannot get started. The twelve links, considered in order, produce three lifetimes. In life A, a specific occasion of ignorance motivates an action establishing a predisposition in the consciousness. That consciousness is the cause consciousness. It produces a new lifetime, life B, consisting of the effect consciousness, name and form, meaning mind and body, the sense spheres, meaning the development of the sense organs, contact, feeling, attachment, grasping, and existence. Existence is the final moment of life B, when a predisposition formerly established in the consciousness has reached maturity and is capable of producing a next birth, life C, which is birth and aging and death. The first two and a half links are called projecting causes. They impel a lifetime. The predisposition established by the original action motivated by ignorance impels it. What it projects are the next four and a half links, which are called projected effects. The next three links are called actualizing causes. They nourish another predisposition to the point where another life, indicated by the last two links called actualized effects, will appear. The next picture is of a person in a boat, which symbolizes name and form. Name refers to the mental consciousness, and form refers to the body. Both are located at the point of rebirth, conception. 
form at the first moment of conception is the egg of the mother and sperm of the father. The body at that time is extremely small, like a bit of thin jelly. We are used to our present body, and it seems we will always be as we are. But in a short time, we will once again have this squishy kind of body. We had such a body not long ago, but are unable to remember. The next picture, an empty house with six windows, symbolizes the six internal sense spheres, the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mental sense powers, which open the way for production of the six consciousnesses. Here the term refers to the different moments of the initial completion of the internal sense spheres in the womb. They do not come to full development at the same time. Through the growth of the body in the mother's womb, the senses develop. At a certain point, the capacity to touch develops. At other points, the capacity to taste, to smell, to hear, and to see develop. In general, there are twelve sense spheres, six internal and six external. These are the sense powers and their objects. This includes the eye sense power with visible forms including colors and shapes as its objects, the ear sense power with sounds as its objects, the nose sense power with odors as its objects, the tongue sense power with tastes as its objects, the body sense power with touches as its objects, and the mental sense power with other phenomena as its objects. In the twelve links, reference is made only to the six internal sense spheres and their serial development in the womb, since the six objects are always present. The internal sense spheres are not the gross organs themselves, but subtle matter within them. Thus, there is subtle matter in the eye and the other sense organs, which, upon maturation, allows us to see, hear, smell, taste, and touch. Through development of these, there is sensation in the womb. The next link, contact, is depicted by a man and woman touching or kissing. The picture symbolizes the coming together of an object, a sense organ, and a moment of consciousness. Hence, contact in the twelve links refers to contact with a sense object and discrimination of the object as attractive, unattractive, or neutral. Sense objects are always present. Thus, when a sense organ develops, then an eye consciousness, ear consciousness, nose consciousness, tongue consciousness, or body consciousness will be produced. Not even the sense organ can act as the substantial cause of mind. It affects mind greatly, but the experiential entity depends upon a former experiential entity. When a meditator looks into his or her own mind, he or she develops a strong realization that mind comes from mind, not from matter. The present mind comes from a former continuum of mind. Even when we are in deep sleep or knocked unconscious, there is still a subtle consciousness working. Following the end of a person's lifetime, a mental consciousness travels in the intermediate state. It then takes rebirth in the mother's womb and, after the visual sense organ develops, acts as the former moment of the first eye consciousness. Thus, the experiential entity of any consciousness comes from a former moment of consciousness. Where does the first moment of the mental consciousness of this lifetime come from? It comes from the mental consciousness of the intermediate state. Where does that come from? It comes from the mind of death. With that mind of death travel all the potencies that have been accumulated in former lifetimes. This deep mind is a repository for everything we have done. It carries these potencies until they are activated. It is the ground of all the predispositions deposited by our actions. None is lost. The seventh link in the twelve links of dependent arising is feeling. This is depicted as an arrow or stick in the eye, a dramatic picture of the centrality of feeling in daily life. The intensity indicates how pleasure and pain control our activities. During development of the fetus, we gradually develop the impression, through contact, that objects are attractive, unattractive, or neutral. From these discriminations arise feelings of pleasure, pain, or neutrality, as the individual internal sense spheres develop. Here, in the twelve links of dependent arising,
feeling ranges from the first moments of pleasurable, painful, and neutral feeling in the womb to development of the capacity for orgasm. But it also refers to periods of feeling throughout the lifetime that serve as objects of the next link. The eighth link, attachment, is symbolized by a group of persons partying. This image refers to our desire to hold on to pleasure, to separate ourselves from pain, and for neutral feeling not to diminish. Although we feel attachment even in the womb, the emphasis in the twelve links is on the specific acts of attachment that nourish the karmic potency that will produce the next lifetime. I wonder whether strong dislike of a person or group can cause one to be reborn like that person or in that group. One can imagine a situation where one is reborn in the country of one's enemies from a previous lifetime and even develops hatred for one's previous compatriots due to the attachment involved in excessive discrimination. The picture depicting the ninth link, grasping, shows a monkey grabbing at a piece of fruit on a tree. Grasping is an increase of attachment and includes strong clinging to pleasant forms, sounds, odors, tastes, and touches, as well as to bad views and systems of behavior. It is possible at any point in one's life to have attachment and grasping that potentialize a karma from the past. But near the end of a lifetime, these two links are particularly influential in shaping the next lifetime. Therefore, it is said that our attitude near the time of death is very important. If you are lying in bed and everyone around you is moaning and weeping, or if they bend over to kiss you with tears in their eyes, you can develop strong attachment, wishing to hold on to a situation you cannot hold on to. How much better it would be if people said, You are going to die. We wanted to say goodbye. No matter how close we have been, lives are lived as in bus stations. We meet for a while but can't stay forever. And now we are going to separate. Best wishes to you. If a person could take it, how wonderful! Otherwise, the dying person develops tremendous desire to stay where she or he cannot stay, and this can result in being reborn as a hungry ghost. As we are dying, we may think, I'd like to be born as a great general. I'd like to be born as a monastic. I'd like to be born as someone who can help other sentient beings. The last two are marvelous. Existence refers to a fully activated karmic potency, ready to give rise to the next lifetime. It occurs during the last moment of the present lifetime. It is depicted by a couple copulating or by a pregnant woman, symbolizing that the karma nourished by attachment and grasping is ready to produce the next lifetime. Existence, the tenth link, is the fully potentialized karmic potency in a person's last moment that will produce yet another lifetime. The cause, the potency, is given the name of the effect, the existence of the new life. The effect is the existence of the new lifetime. The fully nourished potency, the cause, is given the name existence. New life is called birth, the eleventh link. The picture shows a woman giving birth, though the eleventh link refers to the point of conception, not emergence from the womb. The last link, aging and death, is symbolized by adults carrying burdens. One type of aging begins from the moment of conception and the other begins with physical deterioration. Those are the twelve links of cause and effect in pictorial form. With the rooster, snake, and pig at the center, the painting graphically indicates that desire, hatred, and ignorance are at the core of the process, the root problem being ignorance. These lead to favorable and unfavorable actions. Those actions lead to birth in the six realms of cyclic existence. The process by which this takes place is the twelve links of dependent arising, which, according to this system, takes place in three lifetimes. The first two and a half links in a past lifetime, the second half of the third link plus seven in the present lifetime, and the last two in the immediately following lifetime. At present, we engage in ignorance. On the basis of that ignorance, we perform actions. On the basis of those actions, we establish potencies on our consciousness, cause consciousness. We begin many complete actions, which will form paths to other good and bad transmigrations. 
Thus, while one round of twelve links is playing out, others are starting. A potency established in the present lifetime may lead to the next lifetime or to a lifetime four hundred eons from now, whereas the potency that led to this lifetime may have come from an action thirty thousand years ago. In our next lifetime, we will engage in still more ignorance. The motivation for this present lifetime came from one act motivated by ignorance in a former lifetime. This action is called the projecting or impelling cause. Ignorance, action, and cause consciousness drive the lifetime. They establish the general outlines of this lifetime whether we are born as a human or in another transmigration. Then many other actions, called fulfilling actions, filled in the picture. Whether we are female or male, attractive or unattractive, born into a poor family or a rich one, how long we will live, and so forth. One cannot say that everything is predetermined, but we are attracted to a particular situation. When we see that, basically one action led to this lifetime and that during this lifetime we engage in a great many actions based on ignorance, we realize that we are establishing potencies for a great number of lifetimes. If we want to end this process, the weak point is attachment, since even if we have billions of potencies to take billions of rebirth, if those potencies remain unnourished, we will not take rebirth. It would be like having a room full of rice seeds and not planting them. If we can stop attachment and grasping, we can stop the process of rebirth. No matter how many potencies we had, we would no longer be born in cyclic existence. We would be freed. To make attachment impossible, we have to overcome the ignorance that is its root. It is through our not knowing the actual status of phenomena and through conceiving their opposite that attachment is possible. Buddhists do not just suppress attachment, but they understand something that undermines attachment. Desire and hatred become not suppressed but impossible. There is something we can know that will make attachment inoperative. The basis of desire and hatred is unfounded. It rests on the shaky foundation of ignorance. Where does ignorance come from? It comes from former ignorance. We cannot assign it a beginning in time, but we can lay out a lifetime, determine its principal causes, and speak of its beginning in ignorance. Nagarjuna makes these points in his precious garland, where he presents the twelve links of dependent arising in three groups, ignorance, action, and the production of suffering, which are called the three thorough afflictions. He said, As long as the aggregates are conceived, so long thereby does the conception of I exist. Further, when the conception of I exists, there is action, and from it there also is birth. Unquote. As long as the mental and physical aggregates are misconceived as inherently existing, the self, the I, also is misconceived to have the same status, as a result of which there is karma. From karma, birth occurs. Among the twelve links of dependent arising, Ignorance, attachment, and grasping are grouped together as the first of these three, ignorance. An action establishes a predisposition within the consciousness, and that predisposition, when ready to produce a life, is called existence. Thus these two links, action and existence, are called by the name of the second of the three thorough afflictions, action. Nagarjuna calls seven links, from effect consciousness through aging and death, the production of suffering. Nagarjuna also says that three groups cause one another, appearing like the whirling of a firebrand. If you take a stick on fire at one end and turn it quickly at night, someone at a distance will see a wheel of fire. Similarly, the movement of these factors is seen as cyclic existence. Ignorance gives rise to action, and action gives rise to suffering. But they cause each other. For instance, suffering also causes ignorance we respond to suffering in an ignorant way. Thus, in this sense, suffering is a cause of ignorance which causes action. Action causes ignorance, in that one tends to accumulate more wrong views, which produce more ignorance in the future. When we consider the process of cyclic existence, we see that we are drawn into good and bad situations, drawn into suffering over and over again, that we are battered and bruised. Over many lifetimes we cry an ocean of tears. If we piled up the skeletons used by one person, 
we would have a mountain as large as Mount Everest. This is the condition of sentient beings. For a Buddhist, time is not defined by dates and places of birth and death. As a Buddhist, you feel that you have been present throughout time and space. The condition is not that we have only one life confined by this time, confined by this space. We have met many times. We have been through many different relationships. Value is not put just on temporary experience. Through meditation on dependent arising, we generate an understanding of our place in cyclic existence. Once we have understood our place, we can extend that understanding to others and come to feel deep compassion. In the spring of 1984, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, recipient of the 1989 Nobel Peace Prize, spoke about dependent arising in a series of lectures at Camden Hall, London. In five sessions over three days, he presented the basic worldview of Buddhism, how it views the position of beings in the world and how it can make their lives meaningful. An underlying theme of all five lectures and the focus of the last was the fundamental innate mind of clear light. The Dalai Lama describes the obscuration of this pure and innermost mind and its manifestation in the wisdom that realizes the emptiness of inherent existence through implementation of tantric techniques. Indeed, the mind of clear light radiates through his presentation of the harrowing process of cyclic existence and forms the backdrop against which the process is addressed in detail. The way in which dependent arising plays itself out in the nitty-gritty of everyday life is shown in the Dalai Lama's answers to a myriad of questions from the audience. He elaborates on technical issues raised during the lectures and considers many of the difficult problems we encounter in our lives. How to deal with aggression from within and without how to reconcile personal responsibility with the doctrine of selflessness, how to handle a loss of faith in a guru, how to face a terminal illness, how to help someone who is dying, how to reconcile love for family with love for all beings, and how to integrate practice in daily life. The Dalai Lama addresses these and other concerns with heartening directness. His intelligence, wit, and kindness suffuse the lectures. His emphasis on peaceful solutions to personal, family, national, and international problems makes a gentle though powerful argument against choosing allegiance to a particular system as a goal of life. He makes it clear that theoretical systems should be used to serve beings and not the other way round. He calls on his listeners to use ideology for the sake of betterment. I served as interpreter for these lectures and have retranslated them for this tape in an attempt to capture the nuance often missed under the pressure of on-the-spot translation. Jeffrey Hopkins And now, The Meaning of Life, the lectures by His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Lecture 1. The Buddhist Worldview First, let me talk to the Buddhist practitioners in the audience about the proper motivation for listening to lectures on religion. A good motivation is important. The reason why we are discussing these matters is certainly not money, fame, or any other aspect of our livelihood during this life. There are plenty of activities that can bring these. The main reason why we have come here stems from a long-term concern. It is a fact that everybody wants happiness and does not want suffering. There is no argument about this. But there is disagreement about how to achieve happiness and how to overcome problems. There are many types of happiness and many ways to achieve them. And there are also many types of sufferings and ways to overcome them. As Buddhists, however, we aim not for temporary relief but for long-term results. Buddhists are concerned not only for this life, but for life after life, on and on. We count not weeks or years, but lives and eons. Money has its uses, but it is limited. Among worldly powers and possessions, there are good things, but they are limited. However, from a Buddhist point of view, mental development will continue from life to life because the nature of mind is such that if certain mental qualities are developed on a sound basis, they always remain 
and can eventually increase infinitely. Therefore, spiritual practice brings both long-term happiness and more inner strength day by day. So keep your mind on the topics being discussed. Listen with a pure motivation, without sleep. My motivation is a sincere feeling for others and a concern for others' welfare. Meditation is needed in developing mental qualities. The mind is something that can be transformed, and meditation is a means to transform it. Meditation is familiarizing your mind with something new. It means getting used to the object on which you are meditating. Meditation is of two types, analytical and stabilizing. First, an object is analyzed, after which the mind is set one-pointedly on the same object in stabilizing meditation. Within analytical meditation, there are also two types. One, something such as impermanence is taken as the object of the mind and is meditated upon, or two, a mental attitude is cultivated through meditation, as in cultivating love, in which case the mind becomes of the nature of that attitude. To understand the purpose of meditation, it is helpful to divide spiritual practices into view and behavior. The main factor is behavior, for this is what decides one's own and others' happiness in the future. In order for behavior to be pure and complete, it is necessary to have a proper view. Behavior must be well founded in reason, and thus a proper philosophical view is necessary. What is the main goal of Buddhist practices concerning behavior? It is to tame one's mental continuum, to become nonviolent. In Buddhism, the vehicles or modes of practice are generally divided into the great vehicle and the hearer vehicle. The great vehicle is primarily concerned with the altruistic compassion of helping others, and the hearer vehicle is primarily concerned with the non-harming of others. Thus, the root of all Buddha's teaching is compassion. The doctrine of the Buddha has its root in compassion, and the Buddha who teaches these doctrines is said to be born from compassion. The chief quality of a Buddha is great compassion. This attitude of nurturing and helping others is the reason it is appropriate to take refuge in a Buddha. The Sangha, or virtuous community, consists of those who, practicing the doctrine properly, assist others to gain refuge. People in the Sangha have four special qualities. If someone harms them, they do not respond with harm. If someone displays anger to them, they do not react with anger. If someone insults them, they do not answer with insult. And if someone accuses them, they do not retaliate. This is the behavior of a monk or nun, the root of which is compassion. Thus the main qualities of the spiritual community also stem from compassion. In this way, the three refuges for a Buddhist, Buddha, doctrine, and spiritual community, all have their root in compassion. All religions are the same in having powerful systems of good advice with respect to compassion. The basic behavior of nonviolence, motivated by compassion, is needed not only in our daily lives, but also nation to nation throughout the world. Dependent arising is the general philosophy of all Buddha systems, even though many different interpretations are found among those systems. In Sanskrit, the word for dependent arising is pratitya samutpada. The word pratitya has three different meanings, meeting, relying, and depending. But all three mean dependence. Samutpada means arising. Hence, the meaning of pratitya samutpada is that which arises in dependence upon conditions, in reliance upon conditions, through the force of conditions. On a subtle level, it is explained as the main reason why phenomena are empty of inherent existence. In order to reflect on the fact that things, the subjects upon which a meditator reflects, 
are empty of inherent existence because dependently arisen, it is necessary to identify the subject of this reflection, the phenomena that produce pleasure and pain, help and harm, and so forth. If one does not understand cause and effect well, it is difficult to realize that these phenomena are empty of inherent existence due to being dependently arisen. One must develop an understanding that certain causes help and harm in certain ways. Hence, the Buddha set forth a presentation of dependent arising in connection with the cause and effect of actions in cyclic existence, so that understanding of the process of cause and effect could be gained. Thus, one level of dependent arising is concerned with causality, in this case the twelve branches or links of dependent arising of life in cyclic existence. Ignorance, action, consciousness, name and form, the six sense spheres, contact, feeling, attachment, grasping, existence, birth, and aging and death. Then there is a second, deeper level of dependent arising that applies to all objects. This is the establishment of phenomena dependent upon their parts. There is no phenomenon that does not have parts. Thus every phenomenon is imputed dependent upon its parts. A third, even deeper level, is that phenomena are merely imputed by conceptuality in dependence upon their bases of imputation. When objects are sought among their bases of imputation, nothing can be found to be the imputed object itself. Thus phenomena are merely dependently arisen. When the Buddha set forth the twelve links of dependent arising, he spoke from a vast perspective. He taught the twelve links in detail in the Rice Seedling Sutra. As in other discourses, the Buddha teaches by responding to questions. In this sutra, the Buddha speaks of dependent arising in three ways. One, due to the existence of this, that arises. Two, due to the production of this, that is produced. Three, it is thus. Due to ignorance, there is compositional action. Due to compositional action, there is consciousness. Due to consciousness, there is name and form. Due to name and form, there are the six sense spheres. Due to the six sense spheres, there is contact. Due to contact, there is feeling. Due to feeling, there is attachment. Due to attachment, there is grasping. Due to grasping, there is the potentialized level of karma called existence. Due to existence, there is birth. And due to birth, there is aging and death. When the Buddha says, due to the existence of this, that arises, he indicates that the phenomena of cyclic existence arise not through a permanent deity, but due to specific conditions. Due to certain causes and conditions, specific effects arise. When the Buddha says, due to the production of this, that is produced, he indicates that the phenomena of cyclic existence arise from conditions that are impermanent by nature. Then the question arises, if the phenomena of cyclic existence are produced from impermanent conditions, could they be produced from just any impermanent conditions? No. In the third phase, the Buddha indicates that the phenomena of cyclic existence are produced from specific causes and conditions that have the potential to give rise to specific phenomena. Setting forth the dependent arising of suffering, Buddha shows that suffering has ignorance, obscuration, as its root cause. This faulty seed produces an activity that deposits in the mind a potency that will generate suffering by producing a new life in cyclic existence. It eventually has as its fruit the suffering of aging and death, the last link of dependent arising. In the Buddha's teaching of the Four Noble Truths, there are two sets of cause and effect, one set for the afflicted class of phenomena and another for the pure class. Just so, in the twelve links of dependent arising, there are procedures in terms of both afflicted and pure phenomena. Among the four noble truths, the first truth, true sufferings, are effects in the afflicted class of phenomena. The second truth, true sources, are their causes. The third truth, true cessations, are effects in the pure class. And the fourth truth, true paths, are their causes. Similarly, 
When it is explained in the twelve links of dependent arising that action is produced due to ignorance, the explanation is in terms of the afflicted procedure. When it is explained that action ceases due to cessation of ignorance, it is in terms of the procedure of the pure class. The first is the procedure of the production of suffering, and the second is the procedure of the cessation of suffering. The twelve links of dependent arising are thus laid out in terms of a process of affliction and in terms of a process of purification, and each of these is presented in forward and reverse orders. Thus the forward process describes how suffering is produced. It explains the sources that produce suffering. Thus it is explained that Due to the condition of ignorance, action arises. Due to the condition of action, consciousness arises. Due to the condition of consciousness, name and form arise. Due to the condition of name and form, the six sense spheres arise. Due to the condition of the six sense spheres, contact arises. Due to the condition of contact, feeling arises. Due to the condition of feeling, attachment arises. Due to the condition of attachment, grasping arises. Due to the condition of grasping, the potentialized level of karma called existence arises. Due to the condition of existence, birth arises. Due to the condition of birth, aging and death arise. In reverse order, Emphasis is on the first of the Four Noble Truths, true sufferings themselves, which are the effects. It is explained that the sufferings of aging and death are produced in dependence upon birth. Birth is produced in dependence upon the potentialized level of action called existence. Existence is produced in dependence upon grasping. Grasping is produced in dependence upon attachment. Attachment is produced in dependence upon feeling. Feeling is produced in dependence upon contact. Contact is produced in dependence upon the six sense spheres. The six sense spheres are produced in dependence upon name and form. Name and form are produced in dependence upon consciousness. Consciousness is produced in dependence upon action. Action is produced in dependence upon ignorance. Then, in terms of the process of purification, Emphasis is on the causes, the true paths, second among the Four Noble Truths. It is explained that when ignorance ceases, action ceases. When action ceases, consciousness ceases. When consciousness ceases, name and form cease. When name and form cease, the six sense spheres cease. When the six sense spheres cease, contact ceases. When contact ceases, feeling ceases. When feeling ceases, attachment ceases. When attachment ceases, grasping ceases. When grasping ceases, the potentialized level of karma called existence ceases. When the potentialized level of karma called existence ceases, birth ceases. When birth ceases, aging and death cease. In reverse order, within the process of purification, emphasis is on the effects, true cessations, the third of the Four Noble Truths. Thus it is explained that the cessation of aging and death arises in dependence upon the cessation of birth. Cessation of birth arises in dependence upon the cessation of the potentialized level of karma called existence. Cessation of the potentialized level of karma called existence arises in dependence upon the cessation of grasping. Cessation of grasping arises in dependence upon the cessation of attachment. Cessation of attachment arises in dependence upon the cessation of feeling. Cessation of feeling arises in dependence upon the cessation of contact. Cessation of contact arises in dependence upon the cessation of the six sense spheres. Cessation of the six sense spheres arises in dependence upon the cessation of name and form. Cessation of name and form arises in dependence upon the cessation of consciousness. Cessation of consciousness arises in dependence upon the cessation of action. Cessation of action arises in dependence upon the cessation of ignorance. These processes are depicted in a painting called the Wheel of Cyclic Existence with five sectors. Within cyclic existence, gods and demigods are combined in one sector. Then there is a sector of humans. These three are known as the happy transmigrations depicted in the top half of the wheel. The three sectors in the bottom half are bad or low transmigrations. 
those of animals, hungry ghosts, and hell beings. All sectors represent levels of suffering in terms of types of birth. Due to what conditions do these forms of suffering arise? The circle just inside the five sectors of beings indicates that these levels of suffering are produced by karma, by actions. It is in two halves. The half on the right, which is a white base with people looking and moving upward, symbolizes virtuous actions. Such actions are the means of attaining lives as humans, demigods, and gods. The left half, which is a dark base with people facing downward, symbolizes non-virtuous actions, which impel beings towards lifetimes in the lower realms. From what do these karmas that are the sources of suffering arise? They stem from a further source of suffering, the afflictive emotions of desire, hatred, and ignorance, indicated by the innermost circle where a pig, a snake, and a rooster are depicted. The pig symbolizes ignorance, the snake hatred, and the rooster desire. In some versions of the painting, the pig grasps the tails of the rooster and the snake in its mouth, indicating that desire and hatred have ignorance as their root. Also, the rooster and the snake grasp the tail of the pig in their mouths to indicate that each furthers the other. These three circles, moving from the center outward, show that the three afflictive emotions of desire, hatred, and ignorance give rise to virtuous and non-virtuous actions, which, in turn, give rise to the various levels of suffering in cyclic existence. The outer rim, symbolizing the twelve links of dependent arising, indicates how the sources of suffering, actions and afflictive emotions, produce lives within cyclic existence. The fierce being holding the wheel symbolizes impermanence, which is why the being is a wrathful monster. Once I had such a painting drawn with a skeleton rather than a monster in order to symbolize impermanence more clearly. The moon on the far right side indicates liberation. The Buddha on the left is pointing to the moon, indicating that the liberation that causes one to cross the ocean of suffering of cyclic existence should be actualized. The twelve links of dependent arising are symbolized by the twelve pictures around the outside. The first, at the top, an old person, blind and hobbling with a cane, symbolizes ignorance, the first link. In this context, ignorance is obscuration with respect to the actual mode of being a phenomena. Within Buddhist philosophical schools, there are many different divisions. There are many interpretations of what ignorance is. Not only do we not have time to discuss all of these, I do not even remember all of them. Ignorance is the chief afflictive emotion that we are seeking to abandon. One type of ignorance is the mere non-knowing of how things actually exist. However, here, in the twelve links of dependent arising, ignorance is a wrong consciousness that conceives the opposite of how things actually do exist. This is a consciousness that innately misconceives phenomena as existing under their own power as not dependent. Because this consciousness has different objects, ignorance is divided into two types. One conceives inherent existence upon observing persons, called consciousness that conceives the self of persons. Another type conceives inherent existence upon observing other phenomena, called consciousness that conceives the self of phenomena. The conception of a self of persons is of two types. The first is to cognize one's own person, one's own I, and consider oneself to be inherently existent. The second, coarser type, misapprehends other persons as substantially existent, in the sense of being self-sufficient. The former is called the false view of the transitory collection. The innate false view of the transitory collection, which is the root of cyclic existence, is the conception of one's own self as inherently existent and it arises in dependence upon the conception of one's mind and body as inherently existent. In this way, the conception of a self of phenomena acts as a basis for the innate false view of the transitory collection that is a conception of the person as inherently existent, though both types are ignorant consciousnesses that conceive inherent existence. When we reflect on our own desire and hatred, we see that they are generated within a conception of oneself as very solid, due to which there arises a strong distinction between oneself and others, and consequently, attachment to oneself and hatred for others. Attitudes of desire and hatred are all based on an exaggerated sense of I, are they not? There is indeed a valid I, a self that is the doer of actions, 
the accumulator of karma, and the person undergoing the pleasure and pain that are the fruit of those actions. However, when the I becomes a troublemaker, we find that we are conceiving a self-instituting I that is an exaggeration beyond what actually exists. When this I appears to the mind, it does not appear to be dependent upon the aggregates of mind and body. Rather, it seems its own separate entity. If it were to exist in such a solid way, then when one investigates it with the middle way reasoning, it should become clearer and clearer. But in fact, the opposite happens. It becomes less and less clear until it cannot be found. This indicates that, except for its designation in dependence upon the coming together of certain circumstances, it does not exist. It appears to be something that can be indicated concretely, but when we assent to this false appearance, we get into trouble. The conflict between the concrete appearance of the I and the fact that, when analyzed, it cannot be found indicates a discrepancy between its appearance and how it actually exists. Physicists make a similar distinction between what appears and what actually exists. In our own experience, we can identify types of desire. When we see an article in a store and desire it, that constitutes an initial type. But after we buy it and feel, this is mine, this is a different level, which differs in strength. In the first level, the object merely appears without generating desire. Then, when we feel, oh, this is really good, and desire has been generated, this is another level of appearance and apprehension. Upon deciding to buy the article and making it our own, there is a third level of appearance and apprehension. It is crucial to realize from your own experience that, on the first level, there is the appearance of the object as inherently existent. On the second level, there is a consciousness that assents to this appearance apprehending the object as inherently existent and thus giving rise to desire. On the third level, when we have bought such an inherently pleasing object and made it our own, the object becomes involved with a strong conception of ownership in which we consider it to be extremely valuable. At the end of this process, two powerful streams, attachment for the inherently pleasing object and attachment for oneself, have come together, making the desire even greater. Reflect on whether or not this is so. The same is true of hatred. There is an initial experience involving a conventionally valid perception of the qualities of an object. For instance, seeing something bad and identifying it as bad. Then one produces hatred upon thinking, Oh, this is really bad. This is a second level. When the hatred is related to oneself, it is stronger and when it is seen as potentially bringing harm to oneself, even stronger hatred develops. Thus, the ignorance that is the conception of inherent existence assists both desire and hatred. In this way, the cause of all this trouble is the pig, and in the Tibetan calendar, the year of my birth is the year of the pig. This is the way obscuration, ignorance, serves as the root of the other afflictive emotions. This ignorant consciousness is obscured with respect to the mode of being of phenomena. Hence, it is symbolized in the painting by a blind person. Also, since ignorance is weak in the sense that it is not founded upon valid cognition, the person hobbles using a cane. In dependence upon such ignorance, the second of the twelve links of dependent arising, action, occurs. It is called compositional action, because actions compose or bring about pleasurable and painful effects. It is symbolized by a potter. A potter takes clay and forms it into a new article. Similarly, an action begins a sequence that leads to new consequences. Also, once the potter spins the wheel, it will keep turning without further exertion. Similarly, when an action has been done, it establishes a predisposition in the mind, or, as is said in the consequence school, it produces a state of destructiveness of that action, and this has the potential to continue unhindered until it produces its effect. Considering the effects of actions in terms of consequent rebirths in the desire, form, and formless realms, there are virtuous actions and non-virtuous actions, and within virtuous actions there are meritorious actions 
and non-fluctuating actions. In terms of the way in which they are performed, there are actions of body, speech, and mind. In terms of their own entities, there are actions of intention and intended actions. There are also definite and indefinite actions, indicating whether the effect is definitely to be experienced. With regard to the former, the effects can be experienced in this lifetime, the next, or a later one. Also, there are actions that impel one's bodily life in a general way, and there are other types of actions called completing actions that fill in the details of the picture, for instance, causing one's body to be beautiful, ugly, and so forth. Consider a human who undergoes many illnesses. As in the case of all humans, the impelling karma was a virtuous action. The completing actions that fill in the picture by creating a propensity for disease are non-virtuous actions. The opposite occurs when the impelling karma is non-virtuous and the completing actions filling in the picture are virtuous, as in the case of an animal with a good, healthy body. There are also cases in which both the impelling and completing actions are virtuous, as well as the opposite case in which both are non-virtuous. Another division of actions distinguishes those done deliberately, those deliberated but not done, those done but not deliberately, and those neither deliberated nor done. Also, there are actions in which the thought is wholesome, but the execution of the action is unwholesome. The thought is unwholesome, but the execution of it is wholesome. Both the thought and execution are unwholesome, or both the thought and execution are wholesome. How are karmas accumulated? For example, one motivation may lead to certain physical and verbal actions. Good motivation leads to nice words and gentle physical actions, whereby good karma is accumulated. An immediate result is felt in creation of a peaceful, friendly atmosphere. However, anger motivates rude words and harsh physical and verbal actions, immediately creating an unpleasant atmosphere. In both cases, an action is produced with ignorance of the final nature of phenomena as the background. This is the first stage of a karma. When the action ceases, it imprints a potency, a predisposition into the consciousness, and the consciousness carries this to the fruition of that karma. In this way, an action creates both an immediate result and a potential that eventually brings about either a pleasant or painful experience in the future. This is how the first link, ignorance, motivates the second link, action which establishes a potency for future experience in the third link, consciousness. Consciousness is symbolized by a picture of a monkey. Within Buddhism, there are several interpretations of the number of consciousnesses. One system posits only one. Others posit six. Another posits eight. And another, nine. Although most Buddhist systems posit six types of consciousness, the picture is often one of a monkey going from window to window in a house. It probably has its origins in the positing of only one consciousness. When the single consciousness perceives visually by way of the eye, it seems to be an eye consciousness. And when it perceives by way of the ear, nose, tongue, and body, it seems, respectively, to be an ear consciousness, nose consciousness, tongue consciousness, and body consciousness but it, like the single monkey at many windows, is only one. In any case, a monkey is a clever and active animal, and thus can symbolize these qualities. A problem is that between an action and its fruition, there can be considerable time. Yet all Buddhist systems assert that karmas are not lost. Between the cause and the effect, there must be something that connects the two. Many assertions regarding what connects an action with its long-range effect are presented within the Buddhist systems. The best solution is offered in the consequence school as follows. All systems posit that there is a person at the time an action is performed and at the time its effect is experienced. Thus, there must be a continuum of a dependently imputed I, which provides the basis for infusion of the predisposition. As long as a system is unable to present a basis for infusion of predispositions, it has to find an independent basis for infusion of those potencies. This is why the mind-only school posits a mind basis of all as the basis for infusion of predispositions. However, the highest system, the consequence school, has no such difficulty 
since it holds that the continual basis of infusion of predispositions is the mere person, the mere eye, and that the temporary basis for infusion of predispositions is consciousness. In this way, immediately after an action, there is a state of destructiveness or cessation of that action, which, it could be said, turns into predisposition infused in consciousness. The consciousness, extending from this moment until just before the moment of conception in the new lifetime, is called the consciousness of the causal time, or cause consciousness. The consciousness of the very next moment, in which connection to the next lifetime is made, is called the effect consciousness. The effect consciousness lasts to just before the time of the fourth link, name and form, and thus is extremely brief. Concerning name and form, name refers to the four mental aggregates of feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness. Form is the aggregate of physical phenomena. In our painting, it is depicted by people riding in a boat. The boat symbolizes form, and the people symbolize the mental aggregates. The period of name and form continues during the development of the embryo until it begins to develop the five organs. At the end of each lecture, the Dalai Lama participated in a question and answer session. I would now like to read excerpts from the first session. Question. Could you clarify the two types of analytical meditation? Answer. Both analytical meditation and stabilizing meditation are of two types. In the first type of analytical meditation, you are meditating on an object, as when meditating on impermanence. In the second, you are causing your own consciousness to be generated into a state of mind, such as when meditatively cultivating love. When you meditate on impermanence or emptiness, you are taking these as the object of your mind. But when you meditate faith or meditate compassion, you are not meditating on faith or on compassion through reflecting on their qualities. Rather, you are generating your own consciousness into a faithful or compassionate consciousness. Question. How many types of analytical investigation are there? Answer. Within the Buddhist systems, there are four ways of investigating phenomena. The first is to look into the functions an object performs, for example, that fire burns or water moistens. The next is to investigate by reasoning based on valid proof. The third is to look into dependence, as in causation. And the last is looking into just the nature of the object, that something is naturally so. I think there are many phenomena that must be understood in the context of its just being the nature of something to be so. It strikes me that this type of reasoning may be used in connection with the topic of karmic causation. For instance, if one harms someone else, then because the nature of that action is to bring harm to a sentient being, the result naturally is that harm returns to oneself. Similarly, because helping another sentient being has the nature of bringing benefit, the effect that returns to oneself is also beneficial. Also, if one asks why consciousness has the character of experiencing objects, or why physical objects are material, one can look into their substantial causes and cooperative conditions. But when one moves the question further and further back, it is probably just that it is the nature of consciousness to be an entity of experience. If one posited a beginning to consciousness, that position would be exposed to much damage by reasoning. For instance, it would be absurd to claim that a luminous cognitive entity could be produced by something that is not a luminous and cognitive entity. Since there are many such contradictions in that position, it is better to take the position that there is no beginning to consciousness. With regard to particles of matter, consciousness may be able to serve as a cooperative condition in the process of producing matter. But its substantial cause must be something material, since matter must be produced from something of a similar type. For instance, consider our own galaxy or world system of one billion worlds. In the traditional Buddhist presentation, there are eons of vacuity, then eons of formation, eons of abiding, and eons of destruction. This series of four phases goes on and on and on without end. I wonder whether the substances that produce the particles that are the building blocks during the period of formation are present during the period of the eons of vacuity. 
Perhaps the particles of space mentioned in the Kala Chakra system refer to this. Even if five or six billion years have passed since the Big Bang, there needs to be an explanation of what prior causal conditions gave rise to it. Question. Please give your definition of I, the self. Answer. Those who do not have belief in former and future lifetimes may not pay much attention to what the nature of the self is. But among those who do, there are many different assertions. Many non-Buddhist systems posit a permanent self that continues from lifetime to lifetime. They see that something goes from one life to another and clearly the body does not. They cannot posit something impermanent that continues, so they posit a permanent, unitary and independent self that travels from one life to the next. Within Buddhist systems, an I is posited, but not in the same way. Feeling that the I or self must be something that can be posited upon analysis, the lower Buddhist systems hold that something from within, the impermanent collection of mind and body, must be posited as the I or self. Certain of these Buddhist schools posit the mental consciousness. Some posit the mind basis of all. Some the continuum of the aggregates, and so forth. However, the supreme of all Buddhist tenet systems, the consequence school, holds that just as a chariot is imputed in dependence upon its parts and cannot be found among the parts themselves, so a person is merely imputed in dependence upon the mental and physical aggregates but cannot be found among any of those aggregates. Thus, not only is the I dependently imputed, but all phenomena are dependently imputed. Even emptiness is dependently imputed, as is Buddhahood. All appearing and occurring phenomena are just dependently designated. Question. Your Holiness, could you talk about the connection between the five aggregates and the five elements? Answer. First, it is necessary to identify the five aggregates. These are forms, feelings, discriminations, compositional factors, and consciousnesses. Within the form aggregate, the coarser level is our body of flesh, blood, and so forth. And the more subtle levels involve various winds or inner energies described in the highest yoga tantra. In tantra, there are many explanations of movement of basic physical constituents and inner energies or winds in channels whereby different levels of consciousness are produced. The remaining four aggregates are called the bases of the name. These are feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness. The aggregates of feeling and discrimination are the mental factors of feeling and discrimination distinguished from other mental factors. In the Treasury of Manifest Knowledge, Vasubandhu explains that this distinction occurs because discrimination is the source of all dispute, and because one is drawn into afflictive actions, hence into cyclic existence, by attachment to pleasurable feeling and wanting to be separate from painful feeling. Within the fourth aggregate, compositional factors, there are two main types, compositional factors associated with consciousness and those not associated with consciousness. In general, when we speak about beings with a physical body, they have all five aggregates. But in the formless realm, there are only the four mental aggregates. From the viewpoint of highest yoga tantra, however, this is only in terms of coarse form. There are four basic elements of earth, water, fire, and wind. The first, termed earth, refers mainly to solidity and obstructiveness. Water refers to fluidity and moistening. Fire means heat and burning. In coarse terms, wind refers to the air we breathe in and out. But on a subtle level, it refers to energies that promote development and change. For instance, in the Kala Chakra system, it is said that even a dead body still has winds functioning in it, because it continues to undergo change. An additional element is space, which, in reference to the body, means empty cavities and passageways. The Kala Chakra system also speaks of particles of space, which are extremely subtle. Scientists similarly speak of minute particles in space that serve as a basis for other phenomena. Those are the five aggregates and the five elements. Question. Since all appearances and all life are just illusion, 
Is it not inconsistent to say that there are levels of appearance such as those you mentioned this morning? Answer. It is not that life is an illusion. Rather, it is like an illusion. Therefore, we can speak of many different types of discrepancy between the way things appear and the way they actually exist. For instance, something that is actually impermanent can appear to be permanent. Sometimes things that are actually sources of pain appear to be sources of pleasure. These are types of conflict between the way things actually are and the way they appear. As regards final reality, objects appear to exist inherently, but actually lack inherent existence. This is another level of discrepancy between appearance and fact. Question. How does belief or disbelief relate to ignorance? Answer. Mostly, we have the belief that objects inherently exist. They appear to exist from their own side, and we believe that they exist this way. This type of belief is induced by ignorance. Question. If a predisposition toward an action has formed in one's mind, must one complete it, or is there a way out? Answer. If you are able to bring about a condition that is more powerful than the condition that would cause that karma to manifest, it can be overwhelmed. For instance, through disclosing ill deeds, developing contrition, and engaging in virtuous activity, you can diminish its force such that even if you meet with a condition that would have caused it to become activated, it will not. Lecture 2. Life Impelled by Ignorance let us continue the description of the twelve links of dependent arising. The fifth link is the six sense spheres, the inner promoters of consciousness, which are the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mental senses. They are depicted in the painting by an empty house because the external organs for sense consciousnesses are developing, but internally they are not yet functioning. After this comes contact, the sixth link, Contact is a mental factor that distinguishes objects as pleasurable, painful, or neutral upon the coming together of object, sense power, and consciousness. The objects are visible forms, sounds, odors, tastes, tangible objects, and other phenomena not included in those five. The sense powers are the six organs, eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mental sense powers. When an object a sense power, and a former moment of consciousness acting as an immediately preceding condition are present, a consciousness is generated, and contact distinguishes the object as pleasurable, painful, or neutral. In general, a consciousness is produced by three conditions. The first is called the observed object condition. This is an object that causes a consciousness to be generated having the object's own aspect. The second is the dominant condition, a sense power that causes the consciousness to apprehend only its respective type of object, as when the eye sense power gives the capacity to apprehend visual objects but not sounds. The fact that a consciousness is produced as an experiential entity is due to an immediately preceding consciousness. This is the third condition, called the immediately preceding condition. Because it involves a meeting with an object and distinguishing it, contact is symbolized by a kiss. Contact takes place immediately prior to production of feeling. The seventh link of dependent arising, feeling, is a mental factor that experiences pleasure, pain, or neutral feeling once the object has been determined to be pleasurable, painful, or neutral by contact. Feeling is depicted as an eye pierced by an arrow. The eye is so sensitive that even a small condition will cause a great deal of feeling. No matter what kind of feeling we have, it drives us. Pleasurable feeling generates a strong drive for more, and pain generates a strong drive to avoid. The eighth and ninth links, attachment and grasping, are both types of desire. The difference is that attachment is weaker than grasping. There are various divisions of attachment. For instance, desirous attachment is associated with the desire realm. Attachment to destruction is a wish to be separated from painful feeling. An attachment to the form and formless realms is called attachment to mundane existence. 
attachment is depicted as a person drinking beer. This is easy to understand, is it not? No matter that you realize that it makes you fat and you do not want to be fat, you still keep drinking and drinking and drinking it. Attachment increases desire without providing any satisfaction. Grasping, mentally grabbing at an object that one desires, is depicted by a monkey taking fruit. There are four varieties of grasping, at desired objects, at views of self, at bad systems of ethics and conduct, and at any of the remaining types of bad views. There are, however, more types of grasping. For instance, if a person has become temporarily free from desire with respect to the desire realm, and has a correct view but seeks to be reborn in the form or formless realm, he or she is grasping for that type of life and must accumulate a karma that will impel rebirth in that realm. The list, therefore, is formulated only to overcome wrong ideas, not to be exhaustive. Independence upon name and form, sense fears, contact and feeling, one generates attachment to remaining with a pleasurable object and seeking separation from a painful object. When such attachment is produced over and over again in stronger form, this constitutes grasping at desired sense objects, such as pleasant forms, pleasant sounds, pleasant odors, pleasant tastes, and pleasant tangible objects. Such attachment and grasping further charge the karmic potency established in the consciousness by a prior action motivated by ignorance. This causes a new life system in the desire realm. When that predisposition is nourished by attachment and grasping, and becomes capable of producing the next lifetime, it is called existence, the tenth link. Here the cause, the fully potentialized karma, is given the name of the effect, a new existence in the round of suffering. In the consequent school, existence most likely refers to a fully potentialized state of the destructiveness of an action, which is a functioning thing that will produce the next lifetime. The picture of this tenth link is of a pregnant woman. At this point, the karma that will produce the next lifetime is fully potentialized, though not yet manifest. Analogously, a woman late in pregnancy has a fully developed child inside her womb that has not yet emerged. The tenth link lasts from the time of the fully potentialized karma up to the beginning of the next lifetime. The eleventh link is the dependent arising of birth, depicted by a woman giving birth. The child in the womb of the pregnant woman in the previous picture is now changing its state. The twelfth link is the dependent arising of aging and death. There are two types of aging. The first is called progressive since from the moment of conception one is always aging. It occurs in every moment of life. The other type is called deterioration, the usual degeneration of old age. After aging comes death. Between these, there are cries of sorrow and many types of suffering, such as seeking but not getting what you want, getting what you do not want, and so forth. Our lives begin with the suffering of birth and end with the suffering of death. Between these two, there are many consequences of aging and many unfortunate events. This is suffering, the first of the four noble truths, which we do not want, the problem we want to overcome. It is important to investigate whether there is any way to surmount such suffering or not. To understand this, it is necessary to investigate the causes of our situation. This is the relevance of the entire explanation of the twelve links of dependent arising, beginning with a stage of ignorance. When we examine any type of suffering, we find that its root is ignorance. As long as we have ignorance, in any minute we can initiate an action that will serve as a cause for another rebirth. We have a limitless number of such potentialities for future lifetimes in our consciousness right now. We have been considering the twelve links of dependent arising in terms of one round, beginning with ignorance. In this context, we can see that other rounds are operating simultaneously, since other instances of ignorance induce additional series. Also, one round of dependent arising requires intersection with other rounds. For example, Ignorance, action, and consciousness, the first, second, and third links, impel the force producing the next lifetime. But attachment, grasping, and existence, the eighth, ninth, and tenth links, must occur after consciousness and before name and form in order to enable consciousness to produce the lifetime indicated by that fourth link. Also, 
Since the tenth link existence represents fully potentialized karma leading to birth, at the time of that birth, another set of name and form, sense spheres, contact, and feeling will be operating. Hence, a single round of dependent arising involves other rounds. Since the first of the twelve links is ignorance, and the last is aging and death, there might appear to be a beginning and an end. But since many sets operate together, there is no end unless ignorance is removed. Until ignorance is overcome, there is nothing one can do to end this process. If we consider the twelve links of dependent arising related with a lifetime in a bad transmigration, as an animal, hungry ghost, or hell being, in the former life there was a basic ignorance, obscuration with respect to the mode of being a phenomena. There was also ignorance with respect to the relation between actions and their effects. These two were the motivating force producing a non-virtuous action that deposited a potency in the consciousness. This potency then served as the projecting cause of a life in a bad transmigration. The projecting cause was charged by attachment and grasping, becoming fully potentialized as existence. The projected and actualized effects of suffering in a bad transmigration are produced in this way. If we consider the twelve links of dependent arising related with the lifetime in a good transmigration, as a human god or demigod, the basic ignorance is the same, obscuration with respect to the mode of being a phenomena. But the action motivated by the ignorance is a virtuous action beneficial to others, such as abandoning killing. Such a virtuous action deposits in the cause consciousness a good potency for rebirth in a lifetime of high status. This projecting cause was charged by attachment and grasping such that it became fully potentialized as existence, whereupon it produced the projected and actualized effects of a lifetime in the condition of high status. Reflecting on how others travel in cyclic existence increases compassion. Thus, vast methods of meditation are set forth, both reflecting on these twelve links of dependent arising in oneself, whereby wish to leave cyclic existence is developed, and reflecting on these twelve links in others, whereby compassion increases. That completes our discussion of dependent arising as the process of developing a lifetime in cyclic existence. Another mode of dependent arising is the establishment of phenomena in dependence upon their parts. All objects have parts. Physical objects have directional parts, and formless phenomena such as consciousness have temporal parts earlier and later moments that form their continuum. Gross objects are produced through the coming together of many minute particles. No matter how small the particle is, it must have directional parts. Through this logic, it is established that there are no physical objects that are partless. Similarly, with respect to a continuum, if the smallest moments did not have earlier and later parts themselves, there would not be any possibility of their coming together to form a continuum. However, when any object appears to our minds, the whole appears to have its own separate entity, and the parts appear to be its parts. Is this not the case? Thus, there is a discrepancy between the way whole and parts appear, and the way they actually exist. They seem to be their own separate entities, but actually are not. However, this does not mean there are no objects that are wholes, because if there were no wholes, we could not speak of something as being a part of anything. Hence, there are wholes, but they are designated in dependence upon their parts. They do not exist in any other way. This applies not just to changing phenomena, but also to permanent phenomena, and thus is broader in meaning than the former interpretation of dependent arising, which is limited to phenomena arisen in dependence upon causes and conditions. Dependent arising has a profound implication. If one seeks, through extended analysis, the actual object to which the imputation is affixed, one does not come up with anything among or separate from its basis of imputation. 
Take the self or I as an example. The I is the controller or user of mind and body, and the mind and body are the objects of use. The I, body and mind, definitely do exist, and they perform their respective functions. The I is like an owner, and the body and mind belong to it. Indeed, we say, today there is something wrong with my body, therefore I am tired. Such statements are valid, but with respect to one's arm, for instance, nobody says, this is I. Still, when one's arm is painful, we do say, I am in pain. Despite this, it is clear that the I and the body are different. The body belongs to the I. Similarly, we speak of my mind as when we feel my memory is so poor, something is wrong. We can even seem to oppose our own consciousness. Is it not so? We say such things as, I want to train my mind, in which case the mind is both the trainer and the object trained. When the mind is not doing what one wants it to, one is like the teacher and the mind is like the unruly student. In this way, both body and mind are things that belong to the I, and the I is the owner. But aside from mind and body, there is no separate, independent entity of I. There is every indication that the I exists, yet under investigation it cannot be found. For example, the Dalai Lama's I must be located within the confines circumscribed by my body. There is no other place it could possibly be found. However, if one investigates within this area what the true Dalai Lama is, besides this body and mind, the eye does not have its own substance. Still, the Dalai Lama is a fact, a man, a monk, a Tibetan, someone who can enjoy life. Is it not so? This is sufficient to prove that something exists, even though it cannot be found. This means that among the bases of imputation of the eye, there is nothing to be found that is an illustration of the eye or that is the eye. Does this mean the eye does not exist? No, it definitely does exist. But when it cannot be found among its bases of imputation that constitute the place where it must exist, one has to say that it is established not under its own power but through the force of other conditions it cannot be posited any other way. Among the conditions independence upon which the I exists, one of the more important factors is the conceptuality that designates it. Thus, it is said that the I and other phenomena exist through the power of conceptuality. In this way, dependent arising comes to mean not just arisen independence upon causes and conditions or imputed independence upon a basis of imputation, but also arisen or imputed independence upon a conceptual consciousness that imputes the object. Thus, in the term dependent arising, dependent means depending or relying on other factors. Once the object depends on something else, it is devoid of being under its own power. Nevertheless, it does arise in reliance upon conditions, good and bad, cause and effect, oneself and others, all objects are established in reliance upon other factors. They arise dependently. Due to being dependently arisen, objects are devoid of being under their own power. Also, because in this context of dependence help and harm arise, objects do not not exist. Their performance of functions is feasible. In this way, the causes and effects of actions are feasible, as is the I that is the basis of them. When one understands this, one is released from the extreme view of non-existence, nihilism. In this way, existing independence upon conceptuality is also a meaning of dependent arising, the most subtle meaning. Nowadays, physicists explain that phenomena do not exist merely objectively in and of themselves, that exist in the context of involvement with an observer. I feel that the relation between matter and consciousness is a place where Eastern philosophy and Western science could meet. I think this would be a happy marriage with no divorce. If we work along the lines of a joint effort by Buddhist scholars with experience in meditation, 
and unbiased physicists to engage in a deeper research in the relation between matter and consciousness, we may find beautiful things that may be helpful. Also, those scientists working on the human brain in the field of neurology could benefit from Buddhist explanations about consciousness. Some time ago, I asked a neurologist how memory functions. He reported that they still had not found a concrete explanation. So in this field, too, we could work together. Some Western medical professionals are also showing interest in curing certain illnesses through meditation. This is another interesting topic for a joint project. Because of Buddhism's emphasis on self-creation, there is no creator deity. Thus some consider it, strictly speaking, not to be a religion. A Western Buddhist scholar told me, Buddhism is not a religion. It is a kind of science of mind. In this sense, Buddhism does not belong to the category of religion. I consider this to be unfortunate, but in some sense it means that Buddhism becomes closer to science. However, from the scientist's viewpoint, Buddhism is a spiritual path. It is unfortunate that we do not seem to belong to science either. Buddhism thereby belongs to neither religion nor pure science, but this provides us with an opportunity to make a bridge between faith and science. This is why I believe that in the future we will have to work at bringing these two forces more closely together. The majority of people ignore religion, but among those who do not, there is on one side a group who are experiencing the value of a spiritual path, and on the other is a group who are denying any value to religion. As a result, there is constant conflict between these two factions. If, one way or another, we could help bring these two forces closer, it would be worthwhile. Question. Your Holiness, regarding consciousness, it was said that in the Middle Way School, as opposed to the mind-only school, the continual basis of a predisposition caused by an action is the mere I, while the temporary basis was said to be consciousness. Could you explain this further? Specifically, how can the everlasting basis of the predisposition be the mere I, which does not exist inherently or everlastingly? Also, how or what is the mechanism that stores the predisposition, and how does it travel from one lifetime to the next? Answer. When we speak of the nominally existent I that is a mere name, this does not mean that there is no meaning to I or self other than just the name. There is a meaning to which the name I refers. However, because the object I does not exist in a self-instituting way under its own power, but exists depending very much on the name, on conceptual imputation, it is said that it is name only, merely nominally imputed. Thus, in the term mere I, the word mere indicates that when the I is sought under analysis, it cannot be found. Not only is the I merely nominally imputed, but also predispositions themselves, as well as the actions that infuse the predispositions, are nominally imputed, as is everything else. That phenomena are merely nominal does not mean they do not exist at all. Rather, it means that within existing, they do not exist under their own power, by way of their own entity, by way of their own character. When it is said that the basis of infusion and of carrying the predispositions is name only, it might appear to your mind that then the basis of infusion really would not be much of anything. However, this is not the case. With regard to connecting a karma with its effect, consider this. In conventional vocabulary we say, At an earlier time I did such and such and it is a fact that the agent of that action is oneself. But if we look into the matter, the action has ceased, and the I of the present moment is not the I of the previous moment. Still, we say, I did that, and this accords with the fact. One is, therefore, the owner of that action. In this way, there is a connection between the action and oneself. And this is what connects forward to the future effect of that action, no matter how much time passes. Since, for a person who performed an action and accumulated the karma, the continuum of the mere I keeps going, 
one continues to be the I who accumulated that karma. Since the action done earlier has to fructify, there is no one else for whom it can fructify except oneself. The I is designated in dependence upon the mental and physical aggregates, and in terms of the tantric or mantric system, there are coarse and subtle levels of those aggregates. From the viewpoint of highest yoga tantra, the final basis of imputation of the I has to be a subtle aggregate that has been together with oneself since beginningless time. This is a subtle level of consciousness, the continuum of which is beginningless and uninterrupted, eventually reaching fulfillment in Buddhahood. There is no question about whether afflicted minds go on to Buddhahood. Of course they do not. Even coarser levels of consciousness do not. It is only the most subtle level of consciousness that proceeds to Buddhahood. This subtle level has lasted since beginningless time and continues forever. When we die, our coarser levels of consciousness dissolve. On our last day, at the time of our death, the final consciousness that manifests is this most subtle mind of clear light. It is this consciousness that makes the connection to the next lifetime. In this way, the subtler aggregates exist continuously throughout time. With regard to the way in which the I appears, there is a general type of I that has existed since beginningless time right through to the present. But with regard to particular eyes, there is an I qualified, for instance, by one's own youth, and there is an I qualified by being related to a human lifetime, and so on. For instance, we refer to the I of our own youth, oh, I used to be such a rascal when I was young. Many such distinctions are to be made within the I, some general and pervasive, and others more individual and less pervasive. Question. Is material energy the same as mental energy? Answer. In general, because matter and consciousness are different, it seems that the energy associated with them would be different. With respect to mental energy, there are many grosser and subtler levels of consciousness. The grosser level of consciousness is the more it is related to the present body, whereas the subtler a consciousness is, the less connection it has with the gross physical body. Also, the subtler levels of mind are more powerful than the grosser levels. Thus, if one is able to utilize them, they are more effective for mental transformation. In order to discuss differences of energy one has to consider many different levels of matter and consciousness. Question. How can we abandon innate ignorance? Answer. Certain types of ignorance can be removed with little exertion. But the type of ignorance that is the root of psychic existence can only be removed with tremendous exertion. Indeed, the main topic of this series of lectures is how to bring about an end to ignorance. So far, I have been speaking about the foundation of one's practices. Next, I will discuss the levels of practice. Question. What is the most skillful way of dealing with anger and aggression without submitting to the aggressor or becoming angry oneself? Answer. If you keep letting anger out and expressing it, it is very difficult for this to be helpful. Since this behavior itself promotes more anger... It will not bring about any positive result. It will only increase problems. Under certain circumstances, it may be necessary to take a counteraction to stop another's wrongdoing. But without anger, the implementation of countermeasures is much more effective because when your main mind is governed by a strong afflictive emotion, you may not take the appropriate action. Anger destroys judgment, the capacity to think, this is wrong and to investigate what the temporary and long-term consequences of an action will be. It is necessary to calculate such circumstances before taking action. Free of anger, the power of judgment is better. If, in a competitive society, you are sincere and honest, in some circumstances people may take advantage of you. If you let someone do so, he or she will be accumulating bad karma that will harm him or herself in the future. Thus, it is permissible, with an altruistic motivation, to take a counteraction to help the other person avoid the effects of this wrong action in the future. For instance, wise parents, without anger, 
may sometimes scold or even punish their children. But if the parent really gets angry and whacks the child too hard, then the parent will feel regret in the future. However, with the good motivation of seeking to correct a child's bad behavior, it is possible to respond in a way that is appropriate to what the child needs at that moment. Responses should be made in that way. According to the sutra system, use of anger is not permitted in the spiritual path. However, within the tantric system, it is possible to utilize anger in the path. The fundamental motivation must be compassion, but the temporary motivation is anger, and the purpose is to utilize the strength of anger without coming under its negative influence, so that practice becomes more effective. Question. Is it better to leave hatred alone as a potential within oneself or to actualize it and thereby face it? Answer. There is a practice in which to identify hatred, how the hated object appears, how one's mind reacts, what the nature of hatred is, and so forth. One allows the mind to generate hatred and then watches it. But this is not a case of displaying hatred externally and fighting with another person. If there is a danger of your going outside with an angry attitude, it is better to lock your door with you inside, then generate anger and examine it. For certain types of mental problems, such as depression, it can be helpful to let them out by talking about them. This reduces the uncomfortable inner feeling. For other kinds of mental crises, such as anger or strong attachment, the more you express them, the more they will occur. With these types, restraint will cause them to weaken. However, restraint does not just mean that when you develop anger or attachment to a high degree, you attempt at that moment to control it, for that is very difficult. Rather, in a daily practice, you should continuously reflect on the advantages of compassion, love, and kindness, and on the disadvantages of anger. Such continuous contemplation creates dislike for hatred and respect for love. Through the force of this, even when you become angry, the expression changes in aspect and diminishes in force. This is the way to practice. As time passes, mental attitudes can gradually change. Question. How is it possible for me to make an effort in my meditation practice when there is no me, no I? Answer. Most likely, this is the misunderstanding I mentioned earlier, wrongly interpreting the emptiness of inherent existence as an emptiness of existence itself, such that it seems that nothing exists. This is wrong. If you think you do not exist, stick a pin in your finger. Even if you cannot identify the I, that it exists is clear. Question. I have received many initiations from my guru, but now I have lost some faith in him. What shall I do? Answer. This is a sign of your not having been careful at the beginning. If faith alone were sufficient, there would have been no reason for the Buddha to have set forth the qualifications of a guru in great detail. It is said to be very important for both the guru and the student to investigate each other. Still, this situation about which you are speaking does occur. I usually tell people that at the beginning it is not necessary to regard the teacher as one's guru. Rather, simply consider the teacher to be a religious friend from whom you are receiving teachings. Then if, as time passes, you examine the person's qualifications and gain real conviction, you can regard him or her as your guru. Now, to address your question about what to do, if the situation is that you first had faith and now you cannot generate faith, rather than coming to dislike the person, it would be better to develop a neutral attitude. Another helpful technique is to reflect on the fact that in Buddhism, even our enemy is considered to be one of the best gurus. Even though an enemy may deliberately harm you, it is a basic practice to develop deep respect and gratitude toward that person. If that is the case, then it is even more so here since your guru is most likely not deliberately harming you. It can help your mental attitude to look at the situation this way. Question. What is your opinion about Western students of Buddhism doing the practice of protector deities? 
answer. This is a complicated matter. What one does individually is one's own business. However, it is important to understand the context of such a practice. The theory of protector deities comes from tantric practice. In the sutra systems, aside from an occasional mention of the four great royal kings, there is no mention of deities other than the likes of Manjushri, Avalokiteshvara, Tara, Maitreya, and Samantabhadra. In Maitreya's Ornament for Clear Realization, at the point of the serial training in the six mindfulnesses, there is a practice of mindfulness of gods or deities. And it might be possible that these latter deities, as well as the great four kings, appear within this practice. However, the context there is of being mindful of them as witnesses of your own actions. On the other hand, many tantric texts mention protector deities. In the tantric systems, a practitioner of a protector deity first must gain initiation and then attain a deep state of meditation in which visualization practices of deity yoga eventually make one qualified to conduct this practice. While imagining oneself as a deity in a mandala, one visualizes a protector deity in front of oneself and gives him or her an order that has a use in a particular field of action. Hence, if you want to engage in the practice of a protector deity, you yourself must first be qualified. In the past in Tibet, many people did the opposite, completely neglecting their own practice and simply running after protector deities. This is absolutely wrong. One is supposed to achieve a clear appearance of oneself as a divine figure within a full sense of being that deity, whereupon the protector comes under one's control. The practice is not at all a matter of the protector controlling oneself. In fact, the best protector is Buddha, his doctrine, and the spiritual community. In a deeper sense, the actual protector and the actual destroyer are your own karma. If you ask what really helps, it is your own virtuous actions. If you ask what really harms, it is your own non-virtuous action. This is important. Question. Must desire always lead to attachment? Answer. In Tibetan, there is a clear distinction between dupa and duchak. The first means wishing or wanting, which can be reasonable or not, whereas the second is an afflictive emotion. Reason desire exists even in a foe destroyer, someone who has gone beyond cyclic existence. Despite this verbal difference during the initial stages of practice when one is still a common being, it is difficult to distinguish between mere desire and afflictive desire and one could even have faith that is mixed with the conception of inherent existence, or compassion that is mixed with the conception of inherent existence, in which oneself and the object of faith, or of compassion, are wrongly thought to be established by way of their own character. It is difficult to distinguish between these at the beginning, but through practice one can gradually identify the factors of ignorance in the afflictive emotions, thereby making practice more and more pure. Lecture 3. Levels of the Path The twelve links of dependent arising of a lifetime in cyclic existence represent our basic situation, afflictive emotions, contaminated actions, and suffering. Can the mind be separated from such ignorance or not? This needs to be examined. Any type of consciousness is subject to conditioning with familiarization. Still, no matter how much a mistaken consciousness increases in strength due to habituation, it cannot be increased limitlessly, since it does not have a valid foundation. On the other hand, a consciousness with a valid foundation can always be strengthened through conditioning, and eventually can become limitless. It is said that mental qualities have a stable basis, since consciousness on which they are founded has no beginning and no end. So long as one keeps practicing, one's mental qualities do not require the exertion involved in first acquiring them. Hence, their strength can gradually be increased. Since the root of suffering is ignorance, suffering stems from an untamed mind. Correspondingly, since relief from suffering comes from purifying and destroying the ignorance in the mind, it stems from taming the mind. Not taming the mind leads to suffering whereas taming the mind leads to happiness. The mind is tamed by mental training. 
since the trainer is a particular type of mind, and since that which is being trained is also the mind, one has to become skilled in psychology. Thus, in Buddhist texts, a great deal of attention is devoted to the discussion of consciousness. The most untamed type of mind, the grossest level of mind that apprehends its object erroneously, is called wrong knowledge. As the mind becomes accustomed to the teachings, it is transformed into the level of doubt. Within doubt, there are three levels. The lowest is doubt that tends towards what is wrong. The middle is equal doubt that tends toward both what is wrong and what is right. And the highest level is doubt that tends towards what is right. Through practice, doubt is gradually transformed into a level called correctly assuming consciousness, which, through continued training methods such as reflecting on reasons, turns into inference. Becoming accustomed to inferential understanding and developing an increasingly clear appearance of the object being understood, one attains direct perception of that object. To overcome wrong views, one needs to reflect on the absurd consequences of such views. For this reason, Buddhist texts on logic present many forms of absurd consequences. At the level of doubt, it is possible to make use of syllogistic reasonings aimed at inferential understanding. This is why it is important to study the books of the two pillars of logic, Dignaga and Dharmakirti, to develop the wisdom of differentiating phenomena. In the process, a practitioner gradually generates the wisdom arisen from hearing, from thinking, and finally the wisdom arisen from meditation. With this type of practice, one gradually comes to see that it is indeed possible to transform consciousness. From this perspective, one can develop conviction in the efficacy of non-violence. The first level in this practice is to restrain oneself from engaging in activities that harm others. The second is to implement antidotes to afflictive emotions that drive bad actions. And the third is to overcome even the predispositions previously established by afflictive emotions. To remove latent predispositions, it is necessary first to extinguish the afflictive emotions, for without this there is no possibility of extricating the predispositions they establish in the mind. The state of having entirely removed the afflictive emotions as well as their predispositions is called Buddhahood, whereas the mere removal of the afflictive emotions is the stage of an arhat, a foe-destroyer. The destruction of the afflictive emotions and the predispositions established by them is much like an offensive engagement. Thus, it is important to first engage in a defensive line of action, making sure that one will not come under the influence of these counterproductive emotions. This is why it is important initially to restrain ill deeds of body and speech. The final aim is the attainment of Buddhahood, but initially one must prevent coming under the influence of ill deeds. When one acts with a selfish motive and commits wrong actions such as killing, stealing, adultery, lying, divisive talk, harsh speech and senseless chatter, one not only harms others, but ultimately brings suffering on oneself in terms of the cause and effects of actions. By thinking along these lines, one can see that it is necessary to restrain ill deeds of body and speech, and develops the conviction that harming others brings loss to oneself. This is to be reflected upon again and again. It also is helpful to reflect on impermanence. No matter how long our life is, there is a limit to it, is there not? When we think about the formation of this universe, the lifetime of a human is very short, and there is no guarantee that we can live out even a normal human lifespan. Under these circumstances, it is senseless to concentrate all one's energy on accumulating money and property. Since it is clear that wealth is helpful only for this life, it is appropriate to reduce extreme greed. At this level of the teaching, there is no reference to love and compassion for other people. Rather, emphasis is on realizing that the ill deeds are detrimental, even from the point of view of one's own welfare. Also, it is clear from the current world situation that no amount of material progress can fulfill what beings are seeking. 
material progress does solve certain problems, but through our own experience we know that material progress is not sufficient on its own. At this stage, it is helpful to reflect on the usefulness of having gained the state of a human being. Considering how the human body can be utilized in a positive way, one understands that it is sad to use it for a harmful purpose. Also, for some people, it is helpful to reflect on the sufferings of the three bad levels of transmigration, hell beings, hungry ghosts, and animals. If it is difficult to believe that there are hell beings, consider the many sufferings animals undergo. Now we should imagine ourselves living as one of them. We should consider whether we could bear it or not. When we think in this way, we develop a sense of not wanting to be reborn as an animal. What brings about these results are acts of harmfulness and violence against others. That is the first level of reflection on the faults of violence and the need to restrain ill deeds of body and speech. Still, there is no guarantee that even if one restrains such activities this lifetime, one will not come under their influence in the next. Therefore, the best defense is to practice the next level of nonviolence, called active engagement. The afflictive emotions that bring about all this trouble for us are those mentioned in the twelve links of dependent arising. Their root is the ignorance that conceives objects as inherently existing. The force of this ignorance induces desire and hatred, as well as many other types of afflictive emotions such as pride, doubt, enmity, jealousy, and so forth. These are real troublemakers. When we analyze the problems of our present world, whether on the international level or in the family, it is clear that they are related to our anger, jealousy, and attachment. Let us consider our so-called enemy, whom we hate. Due to the fact that this person's mind is untamed, he or she engages in activities to bring injury to us. And because of this, we consider that person an enemy. If the wish to harm were in the very nature of the person, it could not be altered. But it is not the case that hatred resides in the nature of that person. Rather, just like ourselves, the person displays bad behavior due to having generated an afflictive emotion. We ourselves engage in bad behavior, do we not? Still, we do not always think we are completely bad. The situation is the same with this other person, whom we consider to be an enemy. Consequently, the actual troublemaker is not the person, but his or her afflictive emotion. The real enemy is an internal factor. As practitioners, our real battle should take place within ourselves. It will take time, but this is the only way to minimize counterproductive human qualities. Through such practice, we will attain more mental peace. To create peace of mind, the question of whether the afflictive emotions can be overcome is crucial. At this point, one is training to overcome the afflictive emotions, and to do this, it is necessary to destroy their root, which is the ignorance that conceives inherent existence. To do this, it is necessary to generate a reasoning consciousness that perceives objects in exactly the opposite way to how we would perceive them with ignorance. Only such a consciousness can serve as an antidote to afflictive emotions. Ignorance conceives phenomena to exist in and of themselves, whereas in fact objects do not exist this way. To overcome this ignorance, it is necessary to refute with reasoning its conceived object, inherent existence. We must realize that objects do not exist inherently in and of themselves. In order to develop a realization of emptiness capable of removing this ignorance, one cannot merely generate a reasoned inferential consciousness that realizes emptiness. In addition, one must directly perceive the emptiness. To accomplish this, deep concentration is necessary, with which it is possible to develop samadhi, or meditative stabilization, a union of calm abiding and special insight. Thus, it is said that to generate the wisdom consciousness constituted by special insight into emptiness, it is necessary first to generate a calm abiding of the mind, a tranquilization and focusing of consciousness. It is advantageous to develop the mind's ability to remain on its object of observation, and by developing vivid one-pointedness, 
the mind gradually becomes more alert and more able. Someone who wants to achieve mental calm abiding cannot live as we do now, but should stay in an isolated place where continual practice can be cultivated over a long time. In addition, if one works at achieving calm abiding in connection with tantric practices, it is said to be easier. Still, for those not ready for such intense practice, it is helpful to rise early in the morning and immediately use the mind while it is still clear to investigate the nature of mind itself without thinking about other topics. This helps keep the mind alert, thereby helping one throughout the rest of the day. To reach the point where even subtle internal distractions have been pacified and the mind remains continuously on its object of observation, one must first restrain grosser distractions, the coarse ill deeds of body and speech that scatter the mind to objects of desire and hatred. For this, one needs training in ethics. The Buddhist system of ethics contains two levels, one for householders or laypersons, and one for those who have left the householder life. Even within the level of laypersons' ethics, there are several stages. So many variations occur because the Buddha set forth levels of practice in accordance with the varying capacities of individuals. It is crucial to follow a path according to one's own mental disposition. Only then will one gain satisfactory results. Recognizing this is helpful, not only in gaining a proper perspective on Buddhist teachings, but also in developing respect for different types of religious systems since they are all beneficial to those who believe in them. Though the differences in philosophy are tremendous, still one can see that those philosophies are beneficial in the conduct of people's lives relative to their interests and dispositions. Through understanding this, deep respect will be engendered. Today, we need this kind of mutual respect and understanding. Quite a number of Western men and women have become monks and nuns. I respect their decision, but there should be no rush to take vows. Since the Buddha set forth practices in accordance with various levels of capacity, it is critical to determine what one's own level is, and gradually to advance within that. It is important that Westerners who want to practice Buddhism remain in their own communities without becoming isolated. It is important to adopt the essence of the Buddha's teaching, recognizing that Buddhism, as it is practiced by Tibetans, is influenced by Tibetan culture. It would be a mistake for Westerners to try to practice a Tibetanized form of Buddhism, since such a system does not fit with their own minds and makes interaction with society difficult. Nowadays, some people act like Tibetans, even to the point of keeping their heads down in an abject manner. Instead of copying such cultural forms, one should remain within one's own cultural forms and implement the Buddhist teaching if something useful can be found in it. One should work in his or her profession as a member of the community. Although the centers that are already established are useful, it is not necessary for someone who wants to practice Buddhism even to join a particular center. We have now discussed the first two levels of practice, of fighting against afflictive emotions. Next, we will consider the third level, how to develop compassion in order to destroy the predispositions established by afflictive emotions, the obstructions to omniscience. Initially, one trains in ethics, which forms the basis of all later practice. Then, through the practice of meditative stabilization, the mind becomes powerfully focused and effective in meditating on emptiness. Eventually, one overcomes the predispositions. First, intellectually acquired obstructions are overcome. Then gradually, the innate obstructions are removed. Within innate obstructions, there are many levels of afflictive emotions to be overcome. But finally, one completely extricates the ignorance that is the root of all afflictive emotions, the conception of inherent existence. This ignorance and all the afflictive emotions induced by it are extinguished or pacified in the sphere of reality. The wisdom that realizes emptiness directly undermines the ignorance that conceives inherent existence, and the extinguishing of that ignorance is called liberation. As the protector Nagarjuna says in his treatise on the middle, 
When actions and afflictive emotions cease, there is liberation. Actions and afflictive emotions arise from false conceptions, which in turn arise from fictive elaborations. Fictive elaborations cease in emptiness. Unquote. Contaminated actions and afflictive emotions are produced from wrong conceptuality, which is produced from elaborations of the conception of inherent existence. Those conceptual elaborations are ceased through emptiness, or are ceased in emptiness. The former means that conceptual elaborations are ceased through cultivating the view that realizes emptiness. Because they are extinguished in the reality of emptiness itself, here emptiness is also interpreted as that into which the fictive elaborations cease. That reality is the true cessation of the sources of suffering, liberation. Question. I have heard that becoming drowsy during meditation on the breath may indicate that this is not a suitable practice and that one should seek an alternative method. Could you comment on this? Answer. It often happens that when people meditate, they become drowsy. Therefore, for some people with insomnia, I even advise them to recite mantra. During meditation, the mind can come under the influence of lethargy, a heaviness that leads to drowsiness and even sleep. This is due to the fact that the mode of apprehension of the mind has become too loose. A counteractive technique is to make the mind more taut, whereby it is revitalized. If this does not work, then one should imagine something bright or pay attention to details of the object being meditated upon, since lethargy is caused by the mind's being withdrawn too much inside. If this does not work, one can leave the session and look far into the distance, perhaps at a panoramic view, or wash one's face, or go out into the fresh air. If you become sleepy when concentrating on the breath, but do not experience this when concentrating on some other object, it might be suitable to switch your object. It might help to meditate on a certain element, or a certain type of light at a particular channel center, or, while contemplating the breath, to meditate on light in the upper part of the body. In general, when the mind sinks and becomes lax, it is helpful to move the object upward, and when the mind becomes excited, it helps to move the object downward. The remedy has to be geared to the meditator's situation. Question. What advice do you have for the parents of a seven-year-old child who has brain cancer? Answer. No doubt the parents will use every means to bring about a cure medically. In addition, there are cases where it is helpful to employ meditative techniques such as repeating mantras and using certain visualizations. But whether these could be effective right away depends on many factors. In the Buddhist system, when other methods have not been effective, it is beneficial to reflect on the cause and effect of actions, karma. Those who believe in a creator can think of such difficulties as activities of God and gain comfort from this way of seeing things. The most important factor is that the child must remain mentally peaceful. Besides these points, it is difficult to make suggestions. It is said that when the effect of an action is in the stage of manifest fruition, it is difficult to reverse it. Question. We are told that progress along the spiritual path depends upon faith. What is the substantial cause of faith? Answer. In general, faith is of three types. The faith of clear delight, the faith of wishing to achieve a beneficial quality, and the faith of conviction. Concerning the main causes of faith, it is helpful to reflect on reasons that promote conviction and to develop actual experience yourself, whereby faith becomes more firm. Within faith and other types of spiritual experience, there are basically two types one that comes by adventitious causes suddenly sweeping over one and another that comes by exerting effort over a long time. The latter is more stable, but adventitious experiences are beneficial. It is helpful when you have an unusual and profound experience to take hold of it and sustain it with effort at that time. Question. I find it difficult to comprehend all the different levels of practice. What is a simple basic practice that I could bear in mind? Answer. 
At best, if you are able to do so, help others. If you are not able to do so, at least do not harm others. This is the main practice. In terms of the stages of practice, on the first level one restrains ill deeds by avoiding the ten non-virtues, then takes vows relative to that level. Later, one performs more altruistic practices and takes vows related to this vaster level. Question. Is it possible to reconcile special love for one person, as in marriage, with equanimity? Or is it only possible to develop equanimity if one is completely non-attached, with no personal involvements? Answer. During the initial stages of practice, one has different levels of love stronger for those who are, for the time being, closer to oneself, and weaker for those who are not. However, as one practices, one's love becomes equal toward every being. Such all-pervasive love, however, cannot come right away. In the initial stages of practice, love, compassion, faith, and so forth are mostly mixed with at least a little of the afflictive emotions. Question. Many Buddhists find it disturbing to hear of Buddhist teachers who break certain precepts by, for example, saying that it is permissible to drink alcohol, to cohabit with members of the spiritual community, and so forth. Are there ever any circumstances under which these precepts may be broken? Answer. It is said in the scriptures of the Bodhisattva vehicle that for the maturation of one's own mental continuum, there is the practice of the six perfections, giving ethics, patience, effort, concentration, and wisdom. And for the maturation of others, there are the four means of gathering students, giving material things to students, speaking pleasantly, which means to teach how to gain better lifetimes and eventually leave cyclic existence, causing students to practice what is helpful and to discard what is counterproductive, and practicing what one teaches others. When what a person teaches and practices are contradictory, he or she does not have the full qualifications of a spiritual guide. In the Tantra system, there is a procedure for great adepts who are at a very high level of realization to behave in unusual ways. The boundary line for engaging in these activities is said to be when the adept has attained capacity. This means the yogi has reached the point whereby, through the power of yoga, he or she is capable of overcoming the non-faith that would be caused in others by the display of these activities. For instance, the great Pandita, Talopa, despite displaying many unusual modes of behavior to Naropa, was fully capable of overcoming his non-faith. Thus, unusual deeds may be done only after having attained such capacity. On the other hand, if a lama who does not have such a capacity still tries to legitimate his or her irregular behavior, this just indicates that his or her back is to the wall. Question. Would you explain the connection between an action completed many lifetimes ago and its karmic result as experienced through a natural disaster, such as being struck by lightning? Is it that our present consciousness affects or creates the lightning? Answer. With respect to karma it is relatively easy to understand that in general a virtuous action will lead to a pleasurable effect because of a similarity of nature between cause and effect. However, when one considers a specific action at a specific time that creates a specific effect at a specific time, these factors are subtle and difficult to understand. With regard to the example of being hit by lightning, as I mentioned earlier, there are four procedures for investigating objects. One is to examine the nature of an object that is just naturally so, as burning is the very nature of fire and moistening is the very nature of water. Similarly, lightning is produced through the machinations of the elements of this world system itself. But the fact that one was at that spot where the lightning hit is indeed due to karma. Question. How can good Buddhists committed to not killing enjoy the results of murder 
by eating meat, fowl, and fish? Answer. In Buddhist scriptures on discipline, eating meat is not prohibited. Also, monks and nuns, in a sense, are mendicants going out and begging for food, and thus do not state a preference such as, I would like such and such kind of food. Buddhist monks and nuns are, therefore, neither necessarily vegetarian nor non-vegetarian. In the Bodhisattva vehicle, the general emphasis is on being vegetarian. Not eating meat is considered to be preferable, and I think this is the proper practice. Then, in the Tantra vehicle, the three lower Tantra sets, action, performance, and yoga, prohibit meat-eating. But in highest yoga Tantra, there is no prohibition. These are explanations offered by the scriptures on discipline, the sutra vehicle, and the mantra vehicle. More specifically, it is unsuitable to have an animal killed for oneself. For example, in a market in a big city, Meat is already available, but where no meat is available, it is not suitable to say, I want meat. Still, the best way is to be vegetarian. I myself tried in 1965 to become a vegetarian and remained so for 22 months. Then I contracted jaundice and was advised by my physician to discontinue vegetarianism. For those who can follow strict vegetarianism, that is best. Question. Several of us had to tell a few lies at work to be able to come here and benefit from your teaching. Is the bad karma acquired from telling lies countered by the good karma acquired through learning? Answer. It depends on how much benefit is gained. If you implement the teachings and gain something, then it is worthwhile. In Buddhism, the most important considerations are the results of our actions. We have to distinguish what to do and not to do in terms of what can be accomplished. In this context, activities completely prohibited in the scriptures on discipline are not only allowed but are required under certain circumstances. They must be done if they will be beneficial. Just as in medical treatment, different medicines are used by the same person under new circumstances, when purifying the mind, different circumstances call for implementation of different techniques. Lecture 4. The Value of Altruism The practice of the three trainings in ethics, meditative stabilization, and wisdom is capable of destroying the afflictive emotions. However, it is also necessary to get rid of the latent predispositions established by afflictive emotions, and this is extremely difficult. The reason for seeking to eradicate those is that they prevent simultaneous knowledge of all objects of knowledge. The question is how to destroy these predisposing tendencies. The weapon is the wisdom that understands emptiness. But to overcome such latencies, great merit is needed. The technique for accumulating great merit is unusual altruism. Until now, the main concern has been with oneself. In altruistic practice, the concern is with all sentient beings. Sentient beings are limitless. Therefore, when one's consciousness is concerned with this infinite number of sentient beings, the meritorious power accumulated is also limitless. Hence, going for refuge to the Buddha, the doctrine, and the spiritual community out of concern for oneself, and going for refuge out of concern for a limitless number of sentient beings differ greatly in their meritorious power. Also, until now the aim has been to achieve mere liberation from cyclic existence, extinguishment of suffering for oneself. With a more altruistic motivation, the aim is the highest possible attainment, Buddhahood. This entails extinction not just of the afflictive obstructions, but also of their predispositions which constitute the obstructions to omniscience. Thus, also from the viewpoint of the goal, the practices of the altruistically motivated person seeking highest enlightenment will be more powerful and accumulate greater meritorious force. The nature of an altruistic mind is precious. It is amazing that the human mind can forget oneself and consider every other being to be as dear as oneself. That is truly marvelous. I think that with such an attitude, all of cyclic existence would be like nirvana. This is the real source of happiness, not only in the long run, but even today. 
If even the slightest experience of this develops, it will help by bestowing peace of mind and inner strength. It attracts the best of all experiences and provides the best ground for active participation in society. It serves not only as a teacher, but also as best friend and protector. It is truly good. This morning we discussed the philosophical structure that allows us to conclude that it is possible to develop such a beautiful mind. The great Indian Panditas set forth two techniques for development of altruism, one through the seven quintessential instructions of cause and effect, and the other through equalizing and switching self and other. Proceeded by developing equanimity with respect to all beings, the seven quintessential instructions are 1. Recognize all as friends. 2. Reflect on their kindness. 3. Develop an intention to repay that kindness. 4. Generate love. 5. Generate compassion. 6. Develop the resolve of universal responsibility. And 7. Engender an altruistic intention to become enlightened. To generate such a strong attitude in which one promises to seek Buddhahood for the sake of others, it is necessary to generate resolve in which one takes on the burden of others' welfare. To induce this unusual resolve, it is necessary to have compassion in which one cannot bear to see either the manifest suffering of others or their oppression by internal conditions. Thus, from the depths of the heart one wishes that they be freed from such a condition. For, unless one is stirred from the depths by compassion, the high resolve in which one takes on the burden of freeing beings from suffering cannot be induced. It is clear from our own experience that it is easier to generate compassion for persons who are attractive to oneself. Thus, prior to generating great compassion, one needs a technique to cause all sentient beings to appear appealing. This involves viewing all sentient beings the way we view those to whom we are the closest. To view beings this way, it is helpful to use the imagination. Imagine in front of yourself a friend, an enemy, and someone to whom you are completely indifferent. Examine your feelings to see whom you hold dear and whom you consider in a distant manner. Naturally, you feel close to your friend. You feel not only distant, but sometimes angry or irritated toward your enemy. You just feel nothing for the neutral person. You have to investigate why this is so. The first one is your best friend. However, from the Buddhist viewpoint, although today he or she is acting like a friend, this is not permanent, because over the course of beginningless rebirths, in some past lifetime, he or she may have been one of your worst enemies. Similarly, although the other one is today acting like an enemy, you cannot be sure that in a past life he or she was not one of your dearest friends. In the future also, there is no reason why an enemy must always remain an enemy and a friend remain a friend. There is no guarantee even within this life. Today's friend, within a short time, may change. Things are always changing, changing, changing. Sometimes we are successful, sometimes unsuccessful. The basic life structure is not at all stable. Therefore, our experience of such solid feelings towards friends and enemies is absolutely wrong. There is no reason to assume such rigidity. It is foolish, is it not? Considering this will gradually help you become even-minded. The next step is to think that, given that your enemy was in the past or will sooner or later be a good friend, it is much better to consider all three persons as your best friends. Also, you can investigate whether there is value in showing hatred. What kind of result will come from it? The answer is obvious. However, if you try to develop compassion towards these persons, there is no question that the result will be nice. From this viewpoint, you can see it is much better to develop a compassionate attitude equally toward all three types of beings. Extend this feeling toward your neighbors one by one, to those living on this side and then that side of the street, then to the whole country, then to the entire continent, then to all of humanity in this world, and then farther to infinite sentient beings. This is how to practice the seven quintessential instructions of cause and effect. 
The other technique for developing altruism is called equalizing and switching self and other. Here, one should investigate which side is important, oneself or others. Choose. There is no other choice, only these two. Who is more important, you or others? Others are greater in number than you, who are just one. Others are infinite. It is clear that neither want suffering and both want happiness, and that both have every right to achieve happiness and to overcome suffering because both are sentient beings. If we ask, why do I have the right to be happy? The ultimate reason is, because I want happiness. There is no further reason. We have a natural and valid feeling of I on the basis of which we want happiness. It is a human right and a right of all sentient beings. Now, if one has such a right to overcome suffering, then other sentient beings have the same right. In addition, all sentient beings are endowed with the capacity to overcome suffering. The only difference is that oneself is single, whereas others are in the majority. Hence the conclusion is clear. If even a small problem, a small suffering, befalls others, its range is infinite, whereas when something happens to oneself, it is limited to just one person. In this way, oneself seems not so important. Let me describe how I practice this in meditation. Imagine that in front of you, on one side, is your old selfish I, and on the other side is a group of poor, needy people, and you yourself are in the middle, as a neutral third party. Then judge whether you should join the selfish, self-centered, stupid person or these poor, needy, helpless people. If you have a human heart, you will be drawn to the side of the needy beings. This type of contemplation will help in developing an altruistic attitude. You gradually will realize how bad selfish behavior is. You yourself, up to now, have been behaving this way. But now you realize how bad you were. If we really do not want to be a bad person, then the means to avoid it is in our hands. If we train in the behavior of a good person, we will become good. Nobody else has the right to put a person in the categories of good or bad. No one has that kind of power. The ultimate source of peace in the family, the country, and the world is compassion and love. Contemplation of this also helps to develop altruism. Meditating on these techniques engenders conviction, desire, and determination. When with such determination you try, 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 day by day, month by month, year by year, we can improve ourselves. With altruistic motivation, every action accumulates virtues, the limitless power of salutary merit. From a Buddhist viewpoint, what help can we bring others? One important type of charity is giving material things such as food, clothing, and shelter. But this is limited, for it does not bring complete satisfaction. Just as through gradual purification of our own mind, more and more happiness develops, so it is the same for others. Thus, it is crucial that others understand what practices they should adopt in order to achieve happiness. To facilitate their learning these topics, we need to be capable of teaching them. Moreover, since sentient beings have limitlessly different predispositions, interests, potential, and attitudes, we cannot fulfill the hopes of other beings unless we develop the exalted activities of speech that accord exactly with what they need. There is no way to accomplish this unless we overcome the obstructions preventing omniscience in our own mental continuums. Thus, we resolve to attain the stage of Buddhahood in which the obstructions have been extinguished. In this way, the bodhisattva attitude is a mind intently directed toward the welfare of others and aspiring to one's own Buddhahood to accomplish this. Though the final aim is altruistic service upon attainment of Buddhahood, in terms of present implementation, a bodhisattva practices the six perfections, giving, ethics, patience, effort, concentration, and wisdom, in accordance with his or her capacity, beginning with the charity of giving material things. Giving means to train from the depths of the heart an attitude of generosity such that one seeks no reward for oneself. The act of charity and all of its beneficial results are dedicated to other sentient beings. 
concerning ethics, the rude practice of a bodhisattva is to restrain self-centeredness. Since charity cannot involve any harm to others if it is to succeed, it is necessary to overcome the root of any tendency to harm others. This must be done through eliminating self-centeredness since a solely altruistic attitude leaves no room for harming others. In order to have pure ethics, it is necessary to cultivate patience. The practice of patience is extremely important since it is the main bulwark for training in the equalizing and switching of self and others. In his A Guide to the Bodhisattva's Way of Life, Shantideva explains the equalizing and switching of self and others. The practice of patience establishes the foundation for this. It is hardest to generate affection and respect for enemies. When one thinks of enemies in terms of the practice of patience, not only is an enemy not someone who brings harm, an enemy is the most benevolent of helpers. One comes to think, without someone to harm me, there would be no way I could cultivate the patience of being unconcerned about harm to myself. As Shantideva says, there are many beings to whom one can practice charity, but there are very few with whom one can practice patience, and what is more rare is more valuable. An enemy is really most kind. Through cultivating patience, one's power of merit increases, and the practice of patience can only be done in dependence upon an enemy. For this reason, enemies are the main instigators of the increase of meritorious power. An enemy is not someone who prevents, but in fact helps the practice of religion. In his A Guide to the Bodhisattva's Way of Life, Shantideva states a hypothetical objection. But an enemy does not have a motivation to help one, and thus should not be respected. Shantideva's answer is that for something to help, it is not necessary that it have motivation. Even if enemies do not wish to help, it is suitable to respect them since they are beneficial. Thinking along these lines is very beneficial. It helps one to remain happy. Shantideva reasons that if something can be done to fix a situation, there is no need to worry. Whereas on the other hand, if there is nothing that can be done, there is no use in worrying. Another important type of patience is forbearance, the voluntary assumption of suffering. Before suffering ensues, it is important to engage in techniques to avoid it. But once suffering has started, it should be regarded not as a burden, but as something that can assist one. The reasons are many. Through undergoing small sufferings, one can purify the karma of many ill deeds accumulated in former lifetimes. Also, suffering helps reveal the disadvantages of cyclic existence, which helps to develop a dislike for engaging in non-virtues. Suffering also helps reveal the advantages of liberation. In addition, through your own suffering, you can infer what the pain of others is and generate a wish to do something for them. Thinking about suffering this way, one discovers that it provides a good opportunity for more practice and thought. The fourth of the six perfections is effort. Of the many types of effort, one is called putting on armor. It prevents dissatisfaction with the lack of immediate achievement. Effort affords a willingness to engage in enthusiastic practice for eons and eons in order to bring about development. Question. At the time of conception, does the consciousness mix with the developing physical aggregates? Or can the consciousness join the physical body later, just a few moments before birth? Answer. It is said that the consciousness enters at the time of conception itself. To murder a human means to kill either a human or something forming as a human, the latter referring to the period right after conception until birth. Question. Is abortion suitable when severe handicap has been detected in the embryo? Answer. There might be situations in which, if the child will be so severely handicapped that it will undergo great suffering, abortion is permissible. In general, however, Abortion involves the taking of life and is not appropriate. The main factor is motivation. Question. What are the karmic consequences of a woman choosing to have an abortion while understanding that it is wrong to take life? Answer. It is said that if there are no mitigating circumstances, it is worse to do an ill deed knowing that it is wrong. Question. 
What advice can you give to those of us who have had an abortion but are currently practicing Buddhism? Answer. When a wrong deed has already been done, then after learning that it was wrong, one can disclose the faulty deed in the presence of actual or imagined holy beings and develop an intention not to do that action again in the future. This diminishes the force of the ill deed. Question. Please say something about euthanasia, which can be performed either by withholding treatment or by giving a drug that kills the person in a few minutes. Answer. Again, there may be exceptional situations, but in general, it is better to let persons die at their own time. What we undergo is due to our own past actions, and we have to accept what our karma has impelled us toward. Initially, we have to do whatever we can to avoid suffering. Then, if nothing will relieve the problem, the suffering should be understood as the unavoidable result of former actions. Question. Your Holiness, you talked about a subtle consciousness continuing as a stream from one lifetime to the next. But after liberation takes place, what happens to the stream of consciousness at the time of death? Does it continue? Answer. The subtlest level of consciousness proceeds to and through Buddhahood. It is never extinguished. Question. Many of us so enjoy living that we cannot imagine wanting to escape it. Thus, some aspects of Buddhist philosophy seem unduly depressing. Could you please comment? Answer. From a Buddhist perspective, this is a case of not understanding the various levels of suffering. If you are truly happy, then it is okay. Question. I have read about the Buddhist teaching of selflessness, which is often translated as no soul. Yesterday you spoke about the subtlest continuum of consciousness as that which passes from one birth to another and is the inheritor of karma. Is there any essential difference between the subtle consciousness and the Christian concept of soul? Answer. I wonder what a clear definition of soul is in Christianity. Since ancient times in India there have been tenets that assert a self, Atman, which is described as being permanent, unitary, and independent. This type of soul is not asserted in Buddhism. Question. How can I overcome the strong fear of the unkind attitudes of others that I have experienced since childhood? Answer. Cultivation of an attitude of cherishing others more than yourself will gradually help. It will take time. Also, if such a thought constantly causes discomfort for you, it would be better to try to stop thinking about it. Question. What do you think of a Buddhist who does not believe in karma or rebirth? Answer. Generally, whether or not one is a Buddhist is determined by whether one asserts the three jewels, the Buddha, his doctrine, and the spiritual community, as pure sources of refuge. However, there are persons who do this without much thought on complicated matters, such as former and later births, karma, and so forth. On the other hand, some Western people who think more along these lines cannot immediately accept the three jewels and remain skeptical, but nevertheless have high regard for the Buddha, his teaching, and the spiritual community. The latter, it might be said, are persons who are about to become Buddhists. Also, although Buddhists would not assert a permanent, unitary, independent self, there could be Buddhists who would not immediately accept selflessness. Question. How is it possible to practice Buddhism while living among wife, husband, or family who do not practice? Answer. Buddhism is to be practiced individually. There is no necessity to recite texts together, for instance. Question. What is your advice to an ordinary Westerner who is working but wants to complete Tibetan Buddhist practices without becoming a monk or performing a three-year retreat? Answer. Persons should remain in society carrying out their usual profession while internally carrying on analysis and practice. In daily life, you should go to the office, carry out your work, and return home. It would be worthwhile to sacrifice some late evening entertainment, go to sleep early, and get up early the next morning to perform analytical meditation. Then have a good breakfast and go slowly to your work. 
Occasionally, when you have enough money, go to a Buddhist country for a few weeks. I think this may be practical and effective. Question. How can we understand emptiness very simply without getting into too much intellectualized philosophy? Answer. Is not what I have been talking about for the past few days rather simple? The main idea is that when objects are sought under analysis, they are not found. But this does not mean they do not exist. It simply means that they lack inherent existence. If you contemplate this again and again, in time realization will emerge. Question. How should we help someone who is dying? What should we say to the dying person? Answer. It is most important not to cause disturbance in the mind of a dying person, and also it is important to activate memory of a virtuous religious practice with which the person is familiar. Those who do not accept any religion should be helped to die with a peaceful, relaxed attitude. The reason for this is that the attitude that one has near the time of death is extremely important with regard to what karma is being activated, and thus how one will be reborn in the next lifetime. For those engaged in Buddhist practice, there are many levels of reflection that a dying person can put to use. Reflecting on the meaning of emptiness, cultivating an altruistic intention to become enlightened, cultivating deity yoga, engaging in practice of the winds, and even reflecting on undifferentiable bliss and emptiness performing the transference of consciousness, and so forth. No matter how great the benefit may be in the abstract, it is crucial that the dying person be drawn to a practice that is familiar and appropriate to his or her own level. Lecture 5. Compassion and Wisdom Combined As mentioned earlier, an altruistically motivated person matures his or her own continuum by practicing the six perfections and matures the continuums of others by practicing the four ways of gathering students. Among the six perfections, each of the latter ones is more difficult to achieve and is more important than the former ones. The last two perfections are concentration and wisdom. In terms of the sutra vehicle, Maitreya's ornament for clear realization presents 37 paths in harmony with enlightenment for the sake of achieving liberation and many variations of paths for the sake of achieving Buddhahood. The root for all of these is the meditative stabilization described as a union of a calm abiding of the mind and special insight. As a means of achieving this meditative stabilization quickly and powerfully, there is the mantra or Tantra vehicle, comprising four Tantra sets, action, performance, yoga, and highest yoga. The three lower Tantras share the same general mode of procedure, although each has distinctive practices. In both the perfection vehicle and the secret mantra vehicle, practice is rooted in the altruistic intention to become enlightened and the view of the emptiness of inherent existence. The greatness of secret mantra, on the other hand, comes by way of meditative stabilization. Thus, it is even said that the scriptures of secret mantra are included in the sets of discourses, since meditative stabilization is their main topic. In what way does the secret mantra vehicle achieve its distinctiveness through meditative stabilization? How does it have a more profound way of enhancing the meditative stabilization that is a union of calm abiding and special insight? Motivated by the altruistic intention to become enlightened, one aims at full enlightenment. That state of Buddhahood is endowed with a truth body, the fulfillment of one's own welfare, and form bodies, the fulfillment of others' welfare. These two practitioners aim to achieve form bodies in order to assist others. In the perfection vehicle within the sutra system, one seeks to achieve this type of body by accumulating meritorious power through practicing the six perfections with great compassion and the altruistic intention to become enlightened. In addition, the distinctive feature of Tantra is to engage in a technique similar to the type of form body being sought. One meditates on oneself as having the physical body of a Buddha. This is called deity yoga. Since this practice concords in aspect with the result one is trying to achieve, 
Deity Yoga is effective and powerful. In this way, a distinctive feature of secret mantra is a yoga in which method and wisdom are indivisible. In the perfection vehicle, altruistic method and wisdom are separate entities that affect each other. How are the two indivisible within Tantra? In the practice of deity yoga, a single consciousness contains these two factors, the imagination of a divine body and the ascertainment of its emptiness of inherent existence. The imagination of a divine body, which is in the class of compassionately vast appearances, accumulates the collection of merit. Hence, a mind of deity yoga fulfills the feature of altruistic method. Since the same mind ascertains the emptiness of inherent existence of the divine body, wisdom is accumulated. Thus, the mind of deity yoga fulfills the qualities of wisdom. Although method and wisdom are separable conceptually, they are contained in one consciousness. A yogi imagines him or herself in a divine body. When yogis imagine themselves as being a deity and realize the emptiness of that divine body, there is a difference in the impact of this realization due to the divine body, which is the substratum of emptiness. Also, when in the perfection vehicle one meditates on the emptiness of the self and the phenomena included in the five aggregates, one does not engage in techniques to cause the substratum to keep appearing and not to disappear. In the Tantra system, one specifically trains in maintaining the appearance of the divine body in the midst of ascertaining its emptiness of inherent existence. While imagining a divine body, the emptiness of inherent existence of that body is ascertained by the same consciousness. Thus it is said that a factor of the wisdom consciousness that realizes emptiness appears as a deity. Highest Yoga Tantra describes an even more profound way in which altruistic method and wisdom are undifferentiable. This is understood by focusing on more subtle physical and mental factors, the very subtle wind or energy and the very subtle mind, which themselves are an undifferentiable entity. To practice this level, it is necessary to forcefully stop the coarser levels of wind and mind. Highest Yoga Tantra describes many techniques for doing this by emphasis on different places in the body. This is the practice of the channels, the winds or internal energies, and the drops of essential fluid. In general, the cultivation of special insight involves analytical meditation. But due to these special factors, in Highest Yoga Tantra, it is stabilizing meditation that is emphasized when cultivating special insight. Coarser levels of consciousness induce ascertainment through analysis and investigation. On the other hand, when one purposely manifests subtler levels of consciousness through the power of yoga, rather than at times when these happen naturally, such as while dying, these subtle consciousnesses are fully capable of ascertaining meanings. If one engages in analysis at that time, it causes the subtler level to cease and the coarser level to return. Highest Yoga Tantra prescribes two main meditational systems for achieving a Buddha body, through focusing on both very subtle wind and mind and through focusing only on very subtle mind. It is said that, among Highest Yoga Tantras, one group focuses on the channels, winds, and drops of essential fluids in order to manifest the fundamental innate mind of clear light, and another group manifests that mind through sustaining a non-conceptual state without focusing on channels, winds, and drops. Within the first, there are tantras that put particular emphasis on the wind yoga and tantras that put emphasis on the four joys. The great seal and the great completeness are among those systems that manifest the fundamental innate mind of clear light through sustaining a non-conceptual state. Before engaging in the practice of tantra, it is necessary to receive initiation, and after receiving initiation, it is important to keep the pledges and vows that have been bestowed. In initiation, one person transmits a lineage of blessing to another, and even though blessings can be gained via other methods, such as reading books, it is better to receive a blessing from a living person's mental continuum because its benefit forms more easily in the mind. Due to this, in secret tantra, lamas are valued highly. Although Buddhism does not have a creator god, in its many forms of initiation there are a great many gods, 
What are they? From the beginning of bodhisattva practice, one aims to achieve the altruistically active form bodies of a Buddha in order to bring vast effective help to other sentient beings. In Buddhahood, form bodies appear spontaneously and without exertion in order to assist others. Just as when there is a reflection of the moon, there has to be something to reflect it. So the spontaneous appearance of the form bodies of a Buddha require beings before whom to appear. Also, whether a reflection appears clearly or unclearly, big or small, depends upon the surface on which it is reflected. Similarly, the colors, shapes, and aspects of form bodies appear spontaneously to trainees relative to their interests, dispositions, beliefs, and needs. In this way, the gods of the three lower tantras appear in aspects, making use of the five pleasurable attributes of the desire realm. Pleasurable visible forms, sounds, odors, tastes, and tangible objects, but without joining of male and female organs. For trainees who cannot make use of these pleasurable attributes of the desire realm in the path, the form body of a Buddha appears as the supreme emanation body in the aspect of a monk, as did Shakyamuni Buddha. If trainees have the disposition to practice highest yoga tantra, and if their capacities are activated, form bodies manifest to them in the aspect of male and female deities in union. Form bodies appear in a wrathful aspect to those capable of using the factor of hatred in the path, and in a peaceful aspect to those capable mainly of using desire. Thus, form bodies appear in various ways relative to trainees' capacities. A particular Buddha could appear as a single deity, but could also manifest many emanations simultaneously. For instance, Gyuhasamaja manifests as 32 persons in a mandala. But this does not mean that there are 32 persons. There is only one person. The others are just emanations. Hence, among the hosts of deities, there are many that are just reflections of one being. Now let us consider the view in the four orders of Tibetan Buddhism. When the term view is used, it is important to determine its meaning in context. View can refer either to the consciousness that views or to the object that is viewed. In highest yoga tantra, the term view refers to that which views, the consciousness that views. According to its distinctive presentation, while there is no difference in the emptiness that is viewed, there is a difference in the great bliss consciousness that views emptiness. Referring to emptiness as the object viewed, Sakya Pandita, who lived in the 13th century, says that sutra and mantra have the same view. Many Galutpa texts similarly speak about sutra and mantra as having the same view. Nevertheless, in Sakyapa, four different views are posited with respect to the four initiations in highest yoga tantra. The view of the vase initiation, the view of the secret initiation, the view of the knowledge wisdom initiation, and the view of the word initiation. Similarly, some Galutpa texts speak of highest yoga tantra as being superior due to its view, referring to the subject that views, the wisdom of great bliss. Hence, when such scholars say that there is no difference in view between sutra and mantra, they are speaking of the object being viewed, emptiness. However, when they say that sutra and mantra differ in view, they are speaking of the consciousness that views emptiness, since highest yoga tantra presents subtler levels of mind that realize emptiness in a more powerful way. Kajupa and Nyingmapa texts similarly say that the view of mantra is superior to that of sutra. All of them refer to a distinctive, subtler type of mind. Sakyapa texts present a view of the undifferentiability of cyclic existence and nirvana, saying that it is to be delineated in terms of the causal continuum that is the basis of all. There are slightly different explanations of this causal continuum, but it generally refers to the real nature of the mind. In Sakyapa, the causal continuum is identified by the great scholar Mangto Ludrup Gyatso as the fundamental innate mind of clear light. In another interpretation within Sakyapa, it is identified as all of the impure aggregates, constituents, and sense spheres of a person. It is also said that, in the causal continuum, 
all of the phenomena of cyclic existence are complete in terms of nature, all of the phenomena of the path are complete in terms of qualities, and all of the phenomena of Buddhahood are complete in terms of effects. With respect to the equality of cyclic existence and nirvana, in the sutra system Nagarjuna says in his sixty stanzas of reasoning, both cyclic existence and nirvana do not inherently exist. Just that which is knowledge of cyclic existence is called nirvana. In the sutra system, nirvana is the reality into which all sufferings and sources of suffering are extinguished when one has thoroughly understood the absence of inherent existence of cyclic existence. A Sakyapa presentation of the equality of cyclic existence in nirvana explains that the impure phenomena of the mental and physical aggregates primordially exist as pure aggregates. Four mandalas are presented as the foundation, these being the channels of the body, the winds, the drops of essential fluid, and letters. These are viewed as entities of the four bodies of a Buddha. According to Mangto Ludrup Gyatso, all of the phenomena of cyclic existence and nirvana are to be viewed as the sport or reflection of the fundamental innate mind of clear light, since they share the same taste in the sphere of clear light. Thus the doctrine of the undifferentiability of cyclic existence and nirvana stems from the fundamental mind. In Kajupa, meditation on the Great Seal is done by way of four yogas, one-pointed, non-elaborative, one-taste, and non-meditative. The first two are said to be in common with the sutra path. Through one-pointed yoga, calm abiding of the mind is achieved, and through non-elaborative yoga, special insight into emptiness is achieved. Through one-taste yoga, an extraordinary special insight is achieved in which all appearing and occurring phenomena are seen as one taste in the fundamental innate mind of clear light. When this path, which is unique to Tantra, increases in strength, it becomes non-meditative yoga. As Nagarjuna says in his five stages, when one arrives at the union of pure body and pure mind, there is nothing new to learn. About the view of the great seal it is said, the very mind is the innate truth body, appearances are the waves of the innate truth body. The very mind, or basic mind, is the innate truth body, the fundamental mind of clear light. All pure and impure appearances are the sport of that truth body. They dawn from within the fundamental mind of clear light. In Galupa, it could be said that a view like that of the great seal is a special view of the middle way. Such a special view is found in meditations on the view of the middle way that are combined with highest yoga tantra. When one thinks in these terms, the innate level of the union of bliss and emptiness in Galukpa presentations of highest yoga tantra are the same as that of the great seal. Galukpa texts on sutra and even on mantra emphasize the view as the object viewed, that is to say, emptiness. Nevertheless, their texts on mantra speak frequently about the view in terms of the subject the viewing consciousness. Also, it is said that all pure and impure phenomena understood as the sport of emptiness are also to be seen as the sport of the subject, the viewing consciousness, the innate mind of clear light. The yogi, while abiding in illusion-like meditative stabilization, is to view all appearing and occurring phenomena, environments and beings within them, as the sport of illusion-like meditative stabilization. In the view of the great completeness, the mode of explanation is different, but the referent is the same. In the great completeness, the root reference is to the fundamental innate mind of clear light, but it is called ordinary consciousness. A distinction is drawn between mind and basic mind. Ordinary consciousness refers to basic mind. In the Nyingmapa system, highest yoga tantra itself is divided into three categories, maha-yoga, anu-yoga, and ati-yoga. Ati-yoga, or the great completeness, is also divided into three, the class of mind, the class of the great vastness, and the class of quintessential instructions. All of the texts of highest yoga tantra in all of the new translation and old translation schools teach only the practice of the fundamental innate mind of clear light. 
the difference between them is explained as follows. Within other systems, in the beginning stages, one makes use of many practices that involve conceptuality, through which the fundamental innate mind of clear light is manifested. In the great completeness, on the other hand, conceptuality is not stressed. Emphasis is placed on basic mind in dependence upon quintessential instructions. This is why it is called a doctrine free from exertion. Because in the great completeness, tremendous emphasis is placed on the fundamental innate mind of clear light, it includes an uncommon presentation of the two truths, called the special two truths. It could roughly be said that what is fundamental and innate is the ultimate truth, and anything that is adventitious is a conventional truth. From this perspective, the fundamental innate mind of clear light is empty of all conventional truths that are adventitious phenomena, and thus it is an other emptiness. That is to say, it is empty of what is other. Still, the fundamental innate mind of clear light is said to have a nature of essential purity, and hence does not pass beyond the nature of the emptiness of inherent existence set forth in the middle wheel of Buddha's teaching. This other emptiness is in a context of compatibility between the emptiness of inherent existence of the middle wheel and the Buddha nature as it is presented in the third wheel. Because of this, it is described in some oral traditions as a good other emptiness, whereas bad other emptiness stresses only the Buddha nature at the expense of the middle wheel, advocating that the Buddha nature does inherently exist. In this way, many qualified scholars from all of the schools of Tibetan Buddhism have refuted an other emptiness that both presents a final truth that is itself inherently existent and looks down on the emptiness of inherent existence as an annihilatory self-emptiness to be derided. As is said by the great Lama Chense Jamyong Chuki Lodru, when the great Nyingmapa adept Longchen Rapjam gives a presentation of the ground, path, and fruit, he does so mainly from the perspective of the enlightened state of a Buddha, whereas the Sakyapa presentation is mainly from the perspective of the spiritual experience of a yogi on the path, and the Galupa presentation is mainly from the perspective of how phenomena appear to ordinary sentient beings. Through this statement, many misunderstandings can be removed. In practicing systems that emphasize both wind and mind, one achieves a union of pure body and pure mind, illusory body and mind of clear light, independence upon which the supremely altruistic effective state of Buddhahood is attained. In the uncommon mode of procedure of the mother tantras, Buddhahood is achieved by way of a rainbow body. In the Kala Chakra system, which emphasizes the mind, Buddhahood is attained in dependence upon a union of a body of empty form and supreme immutable bliss. The Nyingmapa system of the Great Completeness also emphasizes mainly the mind. Therein, all of the coarse factors of one's body are consumed in dependence upon completion of four levels of appearance, and one achieves a rainbow body of great transference. All of these embodiments of wisdom and compassion exist for the sake of helping other beings extricate themselves from the round of suffering impelled by ignorance.